of the Paso Robles Planning Commission. Please note that due to the COVID-19 emergency and in compliance with the state and county shelter at home orders and as allowed by the governor's executive order M2920, which allows for a deviation of teleconference rules required by the Ralph M. Brown Act, planning commission meetings will be held by teleconference only until further notice. <clears throat> a video stream of planning commission meeting presentations will be live streamed and available to play later on YouTube by accessing the following link, www.prcity.com slash YouTube. Rather than attending in person, project applicants and members of the public must call 805-865-7276 to participate by a phone. The phone line will open just prior to the start of the meeting at 6.30 p.m or written public comments can be submitted via email to planning at prcity.com. 
Written comments received prior to 12 noon on the day of the meeting will be posted as an addendum to the agenda online at www.prcity.com slash agenda center slash planning dash commission dash five. If submitting written comments in advance of the meeting, please note the agenda item. So I would like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting for August 11th, 2020. And first we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Kogler, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And if all others could um, mute your audio so that we don't have a delay. Thank you. I'd be glad to, Madam Chair. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And may we have a roll call? Commissioner Castillo. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Gibson. Here. Commissioner Christensen. Commissioner Kogler. Here. Commissioner Neal. Here. Chairperson Jorgensen. I am here. The record will reflect that Commissioners Castillo and Christensen are absent. Thank you. May we have staff introductions, please? Yes, Warren Frace, Community okay. Development Director with me tonight is uh, Darren Nash, our City Planner, David Athey, the City Engineer, and Darcy Dodago, our Associate Planner. Dick McKinley, Public Works. Julie Dolan, Community Services Department. Tom Frucci, City Manager, and also from the City Manager's Office tonight, we have Dave McHugh, the Information Technology Manager, and Shauna Hauenstein, the Enga uh, Public Engagement Coordinator. Matthew Summers, the City Lori Wilson, Kimberly Hood, Interim. Lori Wilson, Assistant Planner, Sorry, also Kimberly here. Hood, Interim City Attorney. All right, if that is all the staff, thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is general public comments regarding matters that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, I don't see any on my list. Are there any in the queue? No, Madam Chairperson. All right, thank you. And uh, do we have any agenda items proposed to be tabled or rescheduled tonight? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, staff would recommend that uh, the consent calendar, including item number four, which is adoption of new street names for the River Oaks 2 tentative map, if we could move that before the public hearings just to clear that off the agenda. All right. Let me fumble through my agenda to find that. Um, so we will be going then to item I, consent calendar. And um, Madam, number, Madam Chair, yes. this okay. is Commissioner Gibson. I need to recuse myself from the item, that item having to do with the uh, names for River Oaks, please. All right. I have, a Thank you. I, have a I have a conflict of interest. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Gibson. Do we have, still have a quorum? Staff? Yes, with four, you're fine. All right, I lost track of who was in and who's out. All right, so item four, new street names for vesting tentative tract map 3105 River Oaks 2. Um, we have within our agenda those proposed names. Is there any other staff information for us? There is none. We're happy to answer any questions. All right, are there any questions of the commissioners? Let me go through in our usual order. Commissioner Kogler? No questions. Commissioner Davis? I have none. Commissioner Neal? No questions. Commissioner Castillo? Oh, he's not with us. And Commissioner Christensen was also absent, is that correct? Uh, Commissioner Gibson is recused. 
and I do not have any questions. So I would um, entertain a motion. Madam Chair, uh, I would move to approve the street names as referenced in the staff report. All right, Commissioner Kogler, is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Any discussion? And hearing none, I would call for the vote. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Is recused. Commissioner Neal. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 4-0 with Gibson abstaining for a conflict. All right, very good. Are there any other um, agenda items to be rescheduled? For there are none. All right. Um, we will move forward then with item number one which is the Beechwood Specific Plan, SPA 19-01, P12-0002. And this is an item that was continued from the July 27th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. And Mr. Frace, would you explain why we are taking this probably lengthy item first before the uh, other items on the agenda? Yes, at your last meeting, you continued this item. So this is your current um, business item on your agenda. So continued items are heard um, before we introduce new hearing items. So that's why this is first on the agenda. All right, so we, and we would need to reach a conclusion on um, this item before moving on to the next, is that correct? A conclusion as in a vote? Or, a continuance of this item. You, ha you need to take action right. on this item one way okay. or the other. All right, very good, thank you. I just wanted everyone to understand that. Okay, thank you. May we have the staff report? Yes, so as you mentioned, this is a continued hearing of the Beechwood specific plan. The Planning Commission heard it uh, two weeks ago on July 28th. It's been continued date certain to this meeting. Uh, before you tonight is a general plan amendment, a zone amendment, adoption of a specific plan, an oak tree removal permit, a large lot vesting tentative track map, and a development agreement. Um, they're all subject to certification of an EIR. City Council is going to be making the final uh, determinations on all these uh, project components. Um, the Planning Commission's role tonight is to forward a recommendation to the City Council. So, as I mentioned, uh, your last meeting, you um, heard this item. Um, there was a number of questions that came up related to the specific plan, especially the design standards and guidelines. Um, and then there were some additional questions about traffic and emergency services. So based on those issues, the consensus of the Planning Commission was to continue the hearing, give the applicant and staff time to do some additional work on these items and then to continue the hearing tonight. So that's where we're at tonight. So this is the continued hearing. What we issued um, as part of the staff report for this agenda is known as addendum two to the um, original staff report. So all the staff reports, resolutions, and addendum one that were part of the original meeting are still um, going to be considered tonight. And then in addition, we'll be considering addendum two, which makes some changes to the exhibits that were presented two weeks ago. So addendum two does contain new pages to the specific plan that were intended to address uh, the commission's questions. The applicant um, will be going over those uh, momentarily. There is a new Appendix D um, that goes over streetscape and planting plans. That was one of the things the Commission asked for. Um, the existing Appendix D, which was definitions, uh, will become now Appendix E in the specific plan. Uh, staff has provided a memo about police and fire services. There were some questions about that. And then in terms of traffic improvements, especially along Niblick Road, there was a discussion about adaptive signal control technology. So we provided some additional information regarding that. So in terms of the process tonight, um, we're making the staff 
report right now. Um, after our report, we recommend we go straight to the applicant, let them walk us through the changes to the specific plan. Uh, because we're introducing new information, uh, we recommend that we reopen the public comment to take any further comments. After that, uh, we recommend turning it back to the Planning Commission for questions and deliberations. So, as you recall, there was an addendum that was issued to the Planning Commission agenda two weeks ago that included public comments. Um, we had uh, some map changes to Resolution B, which is the general plan amendment. Resolution D, the specific plan amendment, had some descriptions that needed to be changed. And then Resolution E and F, we had to change the oak tree removals from 21 to 18 trees. So just keep that in mind um, as we make any recommendations tonight. We'll also need to consider Addendum 1 in those recommendations. Uh, the applicant um, is proposing some minor modifications to Exhibit F of the Development Agreement. They're shown here on this exhibit. We are recommending that we uh, include this update in the recommendation to Council. It just uh, basically redistributes and recalculates some of the uh, reimbursement fees throughout the project. So your options tonight are one, to recommend to the City Council approval of the project with the 911 units, which is the preferred project under the EIR. Second option to consider would be a recommendation to the City Council of what's known as the environmentally superior project in the EIR, which would reduce the total project density down to 250 units. The problem or issue with this alternative is that the existing zoning is for 674 units. Um, so this would be a down zone. There's a number of legal issues um, tied to a down zoning of the property. So although we have to consider this under the EIR, this is not a recommended action. Um, third would be to recommend denial of the specific plan to the City Council. In that case, the general plan and zoning remain the same, which is 674 units. So the property is not currently zoned ag or open space. It is part of the city limits. It's currently zoned single family residential for 674 units. And then fourth, you always have the option to make additional changes to any of the above options um, or provide alternative direction to staff. Staff's recommendation is option one, which is to recommend approval of the project with 911 units. Um, there's seven different actions that would be required. Resolution A would be to recommend certification of the EIR. Resolution B is recommend approval of the general plan amendments, plus the addendums. Resolution C is recommend approval of the zoning code amendments. Resolution D would be recommend approval of the specific plan with the addendum changes, both addendums one and two. Resolution E is recommend approval of the oak tree removal permit plus addendum one. Resolution F, recommend approval of the large lot tentative track map plus addendum one. And then finally, Resolution D, recommend approval of the development agreement with the update to exhibit F. So that will conclude staff's report. Um, we are recommending we go straight to the applicant and have them walk us through the specific plan changes if that's acceptable. Yes, please, we would like to hear from the applicant. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Dan Lloyd, Project Representative. And with me tonight is Jeff Barfield in the Chambers. Uh, online, we have several people, particularly Lisa Wise. I want to thank you for a, a good hearing two weeks ago. We got a lot of information from you regarding some of the issues that needed to be clarified. And so I want to say we've worked really hard and up until the last <laughs> couple of hours, actually. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa and ask her to go through the changes that we've made to the specific plan and update you on your questions. I would ask you also that you, uh, if you can, take notes and allow Lisa to go through her presentation, identify page numbers or item numbers that you feel want you need further information on, and then we can come back and deal with those all at one time. It seems to be 
an efficient method to do that, and I hope that you concur. Jeff Barfield will be also responding to several of the items as well. So we're prepared to address your concerns as they come up and uh, appreciate your patience. So Lisa, why don't you go ahead and take it over, please? Great, thanks, Dan. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and members of the public. I'm Lisa Wise, part of the development team. As um, Mr. Frey said, based on comments we received on July 28th, we're proposing a number of edits to the plan um, that we want to go through tonight. We have about, about 30 slides to go through. Um, Instead of going page by page, we've grouped these. Um, we've grouped the slides under topics or areas that were of particular concern to the planning commission, planning commissioners. So um, one of the things we heard was um, adding language and clarifications on the process for future subdivisions. So we want to um, go through the changes on that in the plan. Um, related to this, there were a lot of comments and concerns on the design guidelines. Uh, design standards and related images. So we want to. We have a few slides on that. Um, we also heard a lot of comments on parking. So in response to that, we've made um, changes to some of the the pages in the plan related to parking, and we'll walk through that. We've also made a couple of changes um, regarding the perimeter wall um, and the look of the perimeter wall. So it was more. It was um, more clear what the design and materials would be. And then there's five or six other kind of non-related edits that we'll go through um, in one chunk of the presentation. And then Jeff is going to walk through appendices uh, B and D that show street, streetscape planting um, plans. And then there's a few minor edits that we're not gonna cover, but of course, if there's questions on those, um, we'll be happy to, to go through them. So the first, um, the first group of slides really has to do for the, uh, uh, deal with the process for future subdivisions. So in chapter six implementation, we've added two actions um, to this table. In the first one, um, the developer is the responsible party, that's B, um, IA, 9A. And what this does is require the developer to provide architecture, landscaping, streetscaping, and lighting plans for future subdivisions that are consistent with the development standards, design standards, and design guidelines uh, in the plan specifically chapter two, chapter four, and appendices A, B, D. And the second action here um, is for the city um, to um, carry out, and that is to provide, provide design review and approval of future subdivisions and their development plans. Um, this is both for the DRC and the Planning Commission, and again, this needs to be in compliance with um, the standards and guidelines uh, in the plan. And related to this action, we've added this, this table or chart that sort of walks through the current application materials and what's in the plan, um, specifically the specific plan, specifically um, the zoning, the architecture design guidelines and standards, and the circulation, mobility, and infrastructure master plans, and then describes the future entitlement process um, with small lot maps going to the planning commission. And then related to that, the development plans um, they get submitted with these small lot maps and that they have to reflect the, the, the design guidelines and standards in the plan. And of course, those um, development plans are reviewed by staff and then they go both to the DRC and Planning Commission for review and approval. Um, related to the process also in Chapter 2, um, we've added a new design guideline, uh, DG 16, that just kind of emphasizes this again that future subdivisions must have development plans and are reviewed by the city to ensure high quality architecture and designs that conform with the plan. Um, so again, just clarifying the process and adding emphasis on the, the standards and the high quality outcome. Uh, there were also images on this um, uh, page that were um, uh, not appropriate for the plan. We got comments on those for the planning commissioners um, and we, uh, uh, um, substituted new images. So the next section that we wanted to talk about, which we got a lot of comments on from the Planning Commission, is the design guidelines and related images. So after going back and looking at this um, and talking to the development team, we've made several changes in particular to Appendix A. Um, we now have three styles in Appendix A. You can see them here. 
Mediterranean, Modern Farmhouse, and California Contemporary. The California Contemporary is new. It was not in the previous uh, version of Appendix A. That is a new um, recommended style. Um, and in the process, we've removed a couple of things or really folded them into, into these. So we removed Craftsman and we folded Spanish and Monterey into the Mediterranean to simplify it, to simplify this section a little bit and make it more clear um, what the outcomes are. Uh, we also got a lot of comments in this section about pictures um, and pictures being really related to text. And we went back through um, and, and cleaned all that up. So going forward, this was uh, provided more clear direction. And then in chapter two, um, we got comments on pictures. So you can see we've modified the pictures in the bottom. We um, There's three no pictures down there, the two top pictures and the one on the left. Um, and we've added text again that uh, both the standards and guidelines will be used by the city to assess compliance with future development plans, uh, compliance between the development plans and the specific plan, really to achieve that architectural quality and character required by the specific plan. And also related to the design in particular, uh, this is in the commercial section of the design standards and guidelines. We went back through um, and revised all of these pictures to more clearly um, reflect the intended outcome uh, in the commercial area. And there is a typo on that, ages should be edges on the bottom of that little caption. Um, so we'll correct that too. The next um, uh, area that we heard a lot of comments on was parking. Um, we revised the parking uh, images and we added some language for the ADUs, the duplex, duplex, triplex, fourplex, and cottage courts. So you can see on the images, um, it's in your packet and on the screen where we've added um, potential sites for additional parking places. Um, guest parking and parking for ADUs where they put, could potentially be accommodated on site. And then we also added language um, that the specific plan follows chapter 2122 of the city muni code um, for parking requirements. So if they, if and when the plan is silent on parking, um, it reverts back to the city muni code for parking requirements. And then on the perimeter wall, we made a couple changes to 40, uh, 44 and 65. Um, on the left, uh, on page 44, we just deleted that image. Um, this section is really talking about the multi-use pathways uh, anyway, and it's not necessary because we have that image there. So we're taking, recommended taking that picture out. And on page 65, um, we did add a picture, picture that shows the intended uh, materials and look of the perimeter wall. And there's six other edits we wanted to go through just to um, clarify the intent and to point them out to the commissioners. Um, we're recommending uh, on page seven of the plan that this 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 language on chapter 2116K be deleted. It's really describing um, the city's muni code related to neo traditional design, and the development team is not requesting. Um, uh, any incentives or reduction of fees. So um, we're recommending that that be deleted. Uh, on page 22 on the, on the, in the plan under building types, this is, um, this is not something the planning commissioners recommended, but it is something that after going back through and hearing the comments and thinking about the plan a little bit more, um, the applicants requesting that triplexes and fourplexes be allowed and the RF7 zone, really to provide more variety in product types. It's the only change in the zone, um, but um, it's a request to allow triplexes and fourplexes in the RF7. Uh, under landscaping and sustainability design guidelines, uh, there was comments about the pictures here, replacing two of the pictures. Um, the previous pictures were too urban. Jeff uh, has more on this when he talks about some of the updates in Appendix uh, B and D. On page 41 under the community park, we're recommending that we delete this alternative community park image. It's really no longer relevant. For the gateway monument, uh, there were some comments on the notes. So we revised the notes 
uh, and you can see it on this image, and it really clarifies that the developer will, will provide the gateway monument, but the city will control um, the design and look of the monument. And then finally, uh, before Jeff jumps into the appendices, um, there was some questions on the booster station, so we clarified the design and materials uh, in the text. We did not add this image, but it's just an illustration of an image um, we could add, but it just really um, illustrates the intended materials um, and look of the booster station. So split face concrete block, uh, metal roof, and would also have screening and landscaping, as you see in the text. And um, Jeff, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Madam Chair, members of the commission, I'm Jeff Barfield with Rick Engineering. And I'm going to just briefly go through uh, the additions to appendices B and D. And following up with the uh, policies and implementation guidelines that Lisa mentioned, uh, particularly the uh, design policy DG16 and the implementation table 6-10, uh, the landscaping plans and the specific plan have been better defined uh, to respond to the comments made by the commission at the last hearing, uh, starting with uh, Exhibit B, we can have that up. Uh, the typical front yard landscaping has been, um, the image of it has been revised, adding some new elements. Uh, this would kind of depict how the, the street trees and the front yard landscape would, would integrate into that uh, front uh, or parkway uh, concept. Um, we've uh, defined uh, kind of the type of plant or plant material, shrub, and uh, trees that, that could go in that area. There's a little bit more flexibility allowed uh, for the interior of these subdivisions, as you'll see when we get into uh, uh, the, the plant, the appendix uh, D for the uh, streetscapes of the major roadways. Here we want to provide the developer some opportunity to provide their own print on their project. However, all these plants, shrubs, trees, they all follow the city's landscape conservation ordinance. Uh, and I, I also understand that there's some uh, concern about the footprint of the of the building shown, the in this case, a single family dwelling, that it really doesn't match some of the design standards that Lisa just uh, introduced. And uh, we're aware of that, uh, and we have no problem with updating this particular image to provide a two or three uh, representative footprints taken right from the specific plan and uh, better delineate that front yard landscaping. And then lastly, it just provides guidance that the developer builder is responsible for installation of the parkway and the front yard landscaping rear yards uh, by the uh, homeowner. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is the introduction page to the Appendix D, and basically what those two paragraphs indicate is really guidance that's uh, provided on how the plan shall be used by the builder in designing the project, by staff in reviewing it, and by the DRC and the Planning Commission as, as they hear those projects. And um, it does require uh, consistency between the subdivision and the builder uh, and the various builders. As you know, we have potentially four different uh, owners that could uh, put forth their own plans. But I think uh, we believe this language is clear to staff and decision makers that these that the concepts provided on the uh, the upcoming images are required to be followed. Uh, the design is provided for parkways, medians, and multi-use pathways of the major streets. Those are all the perimeter streets, uh, starting with uh, Airport Road that goes through the interior of the project, uh, then uh, Bridge Road, Creston Road, and, um, and Metal Arc Road. Uh, a typical plan is also provided uh, for the water quality basins that are really considered our landscaped amenities at some of the key intersections within the project. So we'll have a picture of that uh, in a minute or two. And then, uh, again, as I indicated, uh, it does provide some flexibility for the streetscape planning on local and interior roads. And uh, lastly, it does allow for variations of these planting plans to be considered by the city uh, if the city can find that the design quality and the consistency along those major streetscapes is maintained. 
So we can just go through, I think previously you saw the, uh, I think that was airport that came up first. Uh, in front of you there are um, streetscape plantings for Metal Arc and Creston Road. That's the north and south roadways. And I think we have an additional one for Beechwood. Okay, here's the, um, the typical water quality base, and this would be, and we have, as you notice from the land plan, we do have quite a lot of water quality basins along those key intersections. Uh, they'll be fenced with view uh, fencing, so attractive, probably a, a tubular steel material. And I think that, is that the last one? I think that's it. So that concludes my presentation. So Warren, at this time, it would be good to hear from uh, any any questions from the commissioners, if you think it's appropriate, or still open up the public hearing. So, Madam Chair, that concludes staff mm -hmm. and the applicant's presentation. All right, I believe staff's recommendation, am I correct, Mr. Frace, was to open the public hearing at this point. That makes sense to me because I think we'll probably have a, a good a good discussion and good amount of questions. Is that was that? That was your recommendation, is that correct? That's correct. All right, I will then open the public hearing. And I, are there any um, members of the public in the queue to speak? No, Madam Chair. All right, well, then we will close the public hearing and we will go ahead with commissioner questions. Um, so these will be questions for the presentation tonight from staff and from the applicant. And I would say any other questions that are left from uh, our last meeting two weeks ago, because we did not move on from questions. It was uh, commissioner questions. We did not proceed on to deliberations. So I will begin with Commissioner Kogler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just um, a few questions. On page 16, it was one of the pages where the images were swapped out. And first of all, I would comment that you did a nice job uh, coming up with images that were more representative of what I think was depicted in the text. But the image on page 16 in the upper right, uh, I would encourage you to find something that's a little less maybe federalist looking in architecture and maybe something that more personifies your Mediterranean farmhouse or contemporary California. Just a comment on that. Um, I raised an issue on page 18, which I don't believe was addressed. And that is the fact that on that page, there is a dot in the residential multifamily 14 for accessory dwelling units, indicating that ADUs would be allowable there, which may well be the intent of the applicant and may be fine with the city, but it is counter what is on the next page on page 19. The first sentence occurs there and it says accessory dwelling units are single residential units on single family residential lots containing no more than one existing single family residence. I can't say the word single enough times in that sentence. And I think either that line, that sentence has to be changed or that dot has to be erased, one or the other. Um, other comments, I had a quick question kind of. Commissioner Kogler, keep in mind these are questions, not comments. Yes. Uh, okay, the question would be there specifically, thank you, Madam Chair, would be which of those should apply? Should the dot go away or should the text be changed in that uh, specific reference that I made? My third is a question, um, and it relates to the city manager's letter, which I think does a nice job laying out the ability of the city to fund a variety of public safety improvements but what it boils down to right now and the times we're in is it's a lot depending on the one cent sales tax. So my question would be if this development proceeds and that does not pass, how does the city back up and do something to provide the needed fire protection and the personnel? And then finally, my last question, Madam Chair, is the in the development agreement that we discussed two weeks ago, uh, there was a comment from one of the attorneys involved that they were going to try to see if they could move up the timing of the community park that's a part of this development. There was no reference to that. Maybe those discussions haven't played out yet, but my question would be, what is the status of that? That's all my questions. All right, thank you. Why don't we go ahead and have staff address those, or staff or the applicant. So the changing the, the uh, page 18 and 19, either the wording or the dot, Yes.
So I'll have the applicant re respond to that one. This is Jeff Barfield. Well, there's there's two options. We could actually remove that dot um, from that, but we do have the opportunity to have single family dwellings in that single family or residential multiple family 14. So I think one option would be to revise that wording to indicate in the um, in the uh, RM14 uh, zone uh, mm -hmm. that if it's single family, you could have an ADU. I think that's, in fact, from my rem memory from the last hearing, I think we, we talked about that a little bit. So I think that would be our preference to allow that flexibility to, to continue. But yep. we understand that in a multifamily uh, situation, you would not add on to that an ADU. So, so I think Commissioner Kogler's staff is comfortable with that table that, as it's currently configured with regard to the ADU. Uh, Mr. Frase, I am as well. I think that a slight revision of that text to clarify that there can be single family within that particular building type category would do it. So that would be the, a change on page 17. Is that where it's at? No, it's on page 19 at the top, accessory dwelling unit. It's in the first and we're, page. we're referring to the pages, the staff report page numbers, right? Not the, not the printed Correct. specific plan page numbers. It can be Correct. confusing. Yeah, and it's the text you have on the screen right now. So basically we'll drop where it's specific to single family house lot. Is that what you, we're talking about? Yeah, I think simply some, and I, we don't have to wordsmith it tonight, but just some manner of indicating that where single families occur in the multifamily zone, that would be allowable, but multifamily probably wouldn't necessarily have that going on. Okay, I think we can clean that up before council. I would think, thank you. All right, and so the fire and police funding timing with, with um, city manager, would you care to address that? I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. The development proposed by the Beachwood development team, and you may want to have them go into more details uh, on this answer, does include the creation of community services districts, both for infrastructure and for services. And Kuda Wekweki completed a fiscal impact analysis that determines how much reven additional revenue over and above the traditional property tax must be generated in order to provide services at the level that the fire chief and police chief in this particular case, it's Mr. Kogler's question, I uh, believe is necessary for this development. So that's not the level of services we're currently providing in the rest of the community. It's the level of services that we desire to provide in the rest of the community, which would be the purpose of the uh, supplemental sales tax. Commissioner Kogler, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, Madam Chair, that's, I think that response satisfies my, my question. Okay, I think I need some more clarification, but we'll go around and, and uh, come back to it in order. All right, so then the development agreement and the, we did discuss it rather late, as I recall last time, about moving up the date for the community park. I don't know that that was changed in the, in the document. So, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, made clear. I should say made clear. I believe the dates were blank in the development plan. Madam Chair Warren Frace, just a quick update on that item. Um, that information, the commission's uh, desire to speed up the uh, timing of the park was, you know, well communicated. So staff and the applicant understand that. We did have a meeting on the development agreement recently. Um, we're still in negotiations on some of the terms on the park, including timing. So we don't have anything specific to um, report tonight, other than we are aware of the commission's um, concern about the timing of the park. All right, thank you. So Commissioner Kogler, are you good on questions for now? 
I am indeed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. Hi, I have a couple of questions and I'm sure I'll have even more in round two. I appreciate coming back at us because the more we hear, the more we want to ask. <laughs> so um, I'll start first with um, parking. I'm going to make reference to the um, staff report page and it's regarding um, accessory dwelling units. I just needed some clarification and, and it's great that you have that slide up there. Um, and I need to move my cursor so I can see the full image here. I guess my question, is it clear enough? I see four different options. I see um, for the ADU, I see parking. That's uh, It's maybe not a technically called stacked parking in the first image. Um, I see a dedicated parking space in the third image. And I see no indication of ADU, ADU parking in the fourth image. Am I... Am I understanding um, the language that ADUs are required to provide parking, but is this clear enough? I'm not sure I understand the fourth image. That's one question. You want me to continue? No, let's, let's take the answers as we go. Okay. So okay. If the applicant could address that. So let's refer that, I think, back to Lisa Wise. Lisa, did you, do you understand that question on that fourth image? Yeah, so um, this was just meant to illustrate various ways that additional parking could be accommodated on site. Um, you know, specific site planning would need to be done. Um, ADUs do not require parking under state law so that you could have parking on site, tandem parking or stack parking, as you called it, uh, to handle cars, um, but you can't require it under state law. Um, in addition, there's only 56 um, ADUs being proposed right now, the project, um, which is approximately, I think, one per block. So at this, at this point, it doesn't seem like there would be a lot of ADUs um, currently being constructed um, under the requirements of the DA. So in the future, I guess, you know, who knows as the site gets built out and people want additional ADUs and they build their own ADUs under state law. Um, but it was just supposed to illustrate some potential on-site parking. Some design options. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and maybe another question for you, Lisa, um, and it's still on parking, but it's back to the community park. And I, I appreciate, um, Commissioner Jorgensen um, re-emphasizing the, uh, the timeline for the park that um, the expressed interest of sooner rather than later. Um, but regarding the parking, we had some discussion um, and some reservation about the reverse parking. Had that been considered at all in, uh, or is, is that more of a development agreement rather than a design standard? H had you considered that comment? We did discuss that, Dan. You might be a better person to take take the parking question on the park, or maybe even Jeff. No, it's uh, uh, back, yeah. Let me back. take this. Pardon me. This is Dan Lloyd. I, I think we're we're of two minds. We can go either way. We think that the the, the reverse parking has been proven to be very productive. I think ultimately this is going to be a council call because we can go either way. But staff seems to be um, interested in giving this a try. And I think you could say a try in the sense that that parking could be reversed back without much difficulty at all. So it's something that uh, we can go either way, but I think that there's a preference on the part of staff to give this a whirl because it does seem to be a productive and safer method although it is unfamiliar and not common in the community. Okay, thank you. It's kind of ironic, right after our planning commission meeting, I went to Bridgeport and I did indeed see that in front of a uh, sporty goods store and I was watching very carefully how it worked. <laughs> um, I am still a bit suspect um, on Beachwood. I think we have some complications there on that street in general. So I'm, I'm not a big fan yet 
um, just wanted to reiterate that. Um, Uh, and again, I don't know if we're supposed to talk about the design guideline changes. I, I also want to compliment um, the developer for um, the improved images um, that we see, better images to reflect the uh, design standards. I think that it's just a marked difference, and I really do appreciate that. Um, I have a question on um, the housing element. I have... Uh, and I do have additional questions on public safety. I guess I can grab that in second round. Um, so I'll let my fellow commissioners add some more. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Neal. I don't have any questions at this time. Um, all right, let's see, Commissioner Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I, I first want to uh, thank uh, staff and the uh, the applicants uh, and uh, this additional information that they provided. I think the plan is uh, much better. Uh, these what we were presented in these addendums has improved the the plan uh, significantly. So I'm going to um, circle back around as I bear with me as I try to build my knowledge and. Uh, my comfort with this plan. So I'm going to circle back around um, to starting on page uh, five. Um, so this is probably going to be a staff staff question, so probably Warren or Darren or somebody like that. Um, the it says that the existing the existing use is within the affordable housing overlay. So there's an exist there's an affordable housing overlay over the uh, area right now is my understanding. Can you explain that to me? What what is what's the significance of, of that overlay? So in the 2014 housing element was adopted and that's the element we're currently um, revising. There was I think five different sites that were identified for affordable housing across the city. Most of the sites were specific to an individual parcel. But in the case of the Olson specific plan area and the Beechwood specific plan area, because these were large specific plan areas, an individual site was not identified. So there was an overlay across the entire parcel that just said that these sites were included in the housing element and that they needed to provide affordable housing units or compact housing units consistent with um, the housing element. So in the case of this project, the Beechwood project, uh, the determination was that the housing element required a minimum of 20 multifamily units to be provided at a minimum density of 20 units per acre. And that is what's included in the specific plan. So this project would be consistent with the 2014 uh, housing element. And as the 2019 housing element is currently written, it will be consistent with that element as well. Okay, all right, thank you. And then uh, next question, which this shows up on uh, page nine, and then it shows also back up in the uh, development agreement. On page nine, uh, it's talking about an option one and an option two, and, and I, I'm totally baffled as uh, trying to make heads or tails as to you know, you know why why we would be doing this. So could you explain this uh, that concept? Because I'm not sure why if if we are doing. Uh, it seems like, if I'm understanding this correctly, that the option one is that, that there would be 53 low income deed restricted units, or we could accept option two, in which case we, we would we would reduce that to 33 low income affordable units, and then there's you know other units. But I'm I'm focusing in on in particular after having a joint uh, meeting with council and trying and, and gaining some more knowledge about the arena why would we why would we want to do option two so i think you're right in that that is a little bit of a confusing section and really the development agreements in addition and above the housing element requirements so i'm going to turn that over to matt summers the uh, city attorney on the development agreement maybe to just kind of walk us through how those options work matt all right thank you thank you sure happy to commissioners 
and chair good evening so there are two options that kind of uh and i'm not sure if we have a a, a nice summary chart of them uh but there's two options that give a couple of trade-offs in terms of length of the deed restriction and type of the affordability so option one is 53 low-income units that is low income is persons making up to 80 percent of the county median income restricted for 55 years the other option is 33 low income units so yes lower on the low income but also 33 moderate income units moderate income is persons making up to 120 percent of the county's median income and then 34 market rate units with the two the two affordable categories the low income and the moderate income restricted for 30 years so if the developer chooses option one they will have to provide more low income units for a longer period of time if they choose option two it's less low income units but more moderate income units for 30 years so the net there is a total of 66 that is 10 more deed restricted affordable units but divided in the two in the two income categories for a shorter period of time and we we kind of came up with this approach of providing two options to give some flexibility to the developer uh mindful of the complex economics of securing affordable housing development and to ensure in either way that we secure affordable housing is needed for the community and uh for a period of time appropriate to the two amounts of housing. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, can we uh, please turn to uh, page uh, six, 670? Bear with me while I do that myself. So this might be just a little Kind of ticky tack, but I was trying to figure this out. So on page uh, 670, uh, item 1.7.3, there's a reference to a 1.7a and a 1.7b, but I could not find those. So that's the development agreement, correct? Yes, correct. And on what, page nine of the development agreement, page 670 of the sure, overall. If I could jump in here, I think that is a straight typo. Okay. Um, the references to section 1.7a and 1.7b should be to sections 1.71 and 1.72. Okay, that's that's what I thought. I just I was just trying to figure that out. I just I couldn't find those sections. So thank you. On um, so Matt, you're going to track that that correction. Yes, I'll mark it down and we'll get that made for council. And, and that was section 1.72 or three. The section needing correction is 1.7.3. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. And then on uh, page 683, I think you might have already answered this. So the um, uh, low income is up to 80% of the uh, median income and the moderate is uh, 120%, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And those are both tested as of the county median income on an annual basis. Okay. All right. All right. On page on page six six eighty six, there's a there's a section in here that I was I'm I'm just I'm again I'm I'm I can't really make heads or tails as to what's supposed to be happening here. So on page six eighty six on the uh, the bottom half of the first paragraph, it's talking about the um, about the uh, uh, river road and charlet improvements uh, shall be accelerated and then it talks about uh, if, uh, if a single developer owns all the remaining property within the pacific plan at the 500th building permit then we for some for some reason we don't need to accelerate a tr3 can you explain why we would do that happy to and i'll also invite dave athy our expert on uh, traffic mitigation measures but here what we're accounting for is that it is unclear whether phase 1a or phase 1b will go first and the traffic impact uh, mitigation fee has been calculated to account for one going first or the other going first and adjustments as necessary and that last sentence or second to last sentence 
last two sentences, that is, in this section 3321, in the kind of middle of the page there, is intended to account for if the developers um, accelerate that uh, uh, South River and Charlie improvements, then they can um, simply have one developer pay for it and pull it out of the um, traffic mitigation, shared mitigation cost fee. In other words, this this is intended to, uh, to give some flexibility to the developer in structuring the traffic mitigation measures and accounting for if it turns out that at 500 units, one developer owns all of it, then it goes back and all they would have to do is complete that measure at the timeline required by the EIR and not in the accelerated timeline versus if it remains in fractured ownership, then it would be accelerated. Okay. All right. Thank you. On uh, page 694, which is page 33 of the uh, uh, DA uh, section um, 3.17.3, it talks about the special services tax rate and uh, and and before this, and there's been a lot of discussion about the idea that this is going to be in effect a, a revenue or cost neutral project. And the number that kept popping up was that uh, $705,997.67 of annual reoccurring costs were going to be covered by the tax on this uh, project. Um, at a, the $774.97 per unit, but this section actually has a lower number. So um, I'm wondering what happened or how do we pay for the difference? This this section is only talking about 811 units, not 911 units, and $628,000 per year compared to 700, almost $706,000 a year of tax that's supposed to be collected. And it might not seem like a lot, but over a ten-year period of time, it's pushing a million dollars. So, what happened? What's what's the why the discrepancy of units and the total amount of tax that the development's going to pay to pay their uh, burden on the city? The unit count discrepancy stems from the fact that it's we aren't sure whether the developer will proceed with option one fifty-three or option two one hundred deed restricted um, affordable units. So that number that's, that's cited there is calculated at, assuming they proceed with option two and 100 units uh, in that affordable category for, and it works out to the figures that are cited. If they proceed with the other option, then this, the next sentence is intended to catch that and have it be readjusted so that it's X amount that will be collected at 774.97 per unit. My understanding is that this is intended to uh, reach the necessary figures to keep it cost neutral. Uh, and at this moment, I'll invite uh, Mr. Boguende to add a little further information on the exact math. Or Warren, perhaps. Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, Kudo Boguende with the BTA. Uh, we, we prepared a fiscal impact analysis uh, that looked at uh, essentially coming up with a, a per unit number that would result in fiscal neutrality. Um, in this case, uh, we're looking at, uh, as um, Mr. Summers mentioned, 811 specific, uh, specific units that are market rate um, and uh, any affordable units are being excluded from um, from paying the tax per the, uh, the, 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 the I think the parameters, uh, at least that the city would like to move forward with. So affordable units are excluded from the tax. And in this case, since uh, option, uh, the, the option that's being pursued is uh, looking at 100 affordable units, uh, we are not uh, considering those as part of the tax. So that that is, uh, obviously those are dollars that the city is not generating specifically from those units. Uh, but I believe uh, it, it's, it's also in line with keeping those units affordable by not imposing uh, a, a, an additional burden of 774 or $75. So that is, I believe, the uh, the intent there. And I, uh, Warren, uh, if, if you have any additional thoughts, that'd be great. 
And if I could add one more quick point before Mr. Frace, the uh, option two, the 100 units, does include 34 market rate units that I think would be subject to the tax because they would not be deed restricted affordable units. But in option two, the 66 deed restricted affordable units at the low and the moderate income levels would be exempt from the tax as part of the city's promotion of affordable housing. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pondering, I'm pondering the information that you're sharing with me. So, <laughs> so what I heard was that if they build affordable units, that there would be no tax on them. But would that mean that then that the project would would uh, actually caught be costing the city? Then it would not be carrying its uh, fiscal share of the impact on the city. So I think uh, Commissioner Gibson, Warren Frace here, I think in general, the city policy is that um, we shoot for revenue neutrality, um, but when we're trying to balance that with affordability, uh, the policy of the city has been to uh, waive CFD fees on affordable units because it basically makes those units potentially not affordable any longer. So there is a trade off there, so you don't, achieve 100% neutrality, um, but you do meet the affordable housing objective. And typically we are trying to always be balancing kind of competing priorities. And this is a good example of that. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank, thank you for your response so much. Last, last question on the new section that, uh, that you gave us the addendum, and I'm trying to figure out how to tell you what page, it looks like it's page 41. And it has a, it's a uh, illustration of uh, Creston Road. Are you are you with me on that? Just want to. Yeah, give me a second. Let me pull it up. So it's forty page forty one. I believe not the specific plan page, but the staff report page. Correct. Yeah, correct. The, yes, the new addendum. All right, I'm almost there. Okay, here it comes. Okay, so I, I, I'm not sure if I'm just being too literal, but on the uh, picture of the on the bottom, I'm not seeing any wall being illustrated um, on Creston Road. Is but is the intent to have a, a wall on Creston Road, a privacy wall on on the uh, south end of the project? Be so a, you know, I'll have, we'll have the um, applicant explain that because there's kind of multiple situations along that segment of street. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff Barfield. We have uh, one commercial properties along that wall, as well, uh, along that roadway, as well as multifamily. So we don't envision really the the typical perimeter wall that we would expect on some of the other sound and and security walls along the other uh, areas within the specific plan. So no. um, I, I'm assuming then that that would be somebody's backyard that would be uh, facing uh, would be along Creston Road, what sort of walls then would be proposed be put along Creston Road for the residential section? <clears throat> well, I don't think there are uh, residential lots that back on to Creston Road. If you look at the illustrative uh, development plan and that zoning, uh, you'll see okay. that uh, at the intersection of Creston Road and Beechwood, the kind of southwest corner, that's, uh, All right. yep. that's wetland. Uh, yeah, no, I see it. So then the but there would be perimeter walls on on the uh, the southern edge of the development where, where there is residential. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, yes. Yes. OK. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions for now. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Gibson. And I have some questions as well. Some of these are kind of housekeeping and some are bigger issues. Um, on page 13 of the uh, addendum of the staff report today, it is the list of changes to the specific plan. And I got a little lost in the presentation in, on the appendices. So the appendix A is the updated architectural style guide. I understand that. Appendix B, it says revised appendix to be provided separately. And I believe that's what we were just looking at for the street landscaping. Is that correct? And so then I, is there an appendix? What is appendix C? Let me just go through all of these. Um, appendix D says um, 
Well, that's his streetscape planning plan. So what is B, what is C, and then on D it says additional images to be provided separately, and on B it says to be provided separately, and then I believe Mr. Price said we were changing definitions which were listed in the previous draft of the specific plan, but I don't remember seeing any. That was going to be Appendix E, but I still don't recall seeing any. So if you could just clarify those appendices for me, I'd appreciate it. So we'll refer that back to the applicant. Jeff Barfield again. The uh, appendix B, that comment about uh, provided separately at the time we were hustling with all the changes that the commission was had been requesting. So we, uh, at the time that this was prepared, we did not have appendix B prepared as you saw it today. So that kind of explains that. In other words, what you're seeing is appendix B uh, as it was meant to be presented, although with a caveat that we understand the the single family footprints aren't really what you'd like to see. So we're definitely open to modifying that uh, exhibit or appendix one more time. And same thing for appendix D, we were still putting together the uh, six or seven streetscape plans for all the major roadways and the drainage basins. So those you did see, and they are the latest that we've prepared. Okay, what about C and E? Uh, appendix E is the definitions. And at least you're going to have, have to help me on C. I'm drawing a blank on what Appendix C is. C is uh, the general plan consistency table. There you go. Okay. Do we have definitions? I don't remember seeing any. Yes. They're in the specific plan version from the previous agenda. Are they? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for cleaning that up. Um, on page 83 of the staff report, it changes, um, there's a phasing change to delay 32 multifamily units to phase two and to therefore fill that void with 32 single family residents in phase one, single family more, 32 more single family residences in phase one. Uh, I don't think this is reflective of the community's short-term needs. So I'm wondering why this was done and is there a trade-off to the city that we benefit from that change in some way? So I'll have the applicant um, explain the phasing change on those 32 units. Jeff Barfield, the uh, 32 units are, are what came off the park. So originally that park was gonna be roughly five and a half, six acres. And of course at the city's uh, a request, uh, we've increased that. So those 32 units had to go somewhere. And the plan is to actually have them go into phase two, as you've indicated, but as really a part of the multifamily uh, component. So if you look at, in, in fact, uh, one potential area for those to go into are the mixed use areas along Creston Road. So I think the image that we have up there on the screen right now does show that that in fact happens. You see that the, in phase two, multifamily DUs go from 173 to 205. And the units uh, drop from phase one from, uh, from 80 down to 48. And Madam Chair, the Stan Lloyd, uh, just one other further comment on that is that we really are, you know, We've been working really hard with the city to try to improve affordability. And the more we can do to transfer single family units to more multifamily units, we think we do a better job at providing better affordability for the community. Thank you. And I would certainly agree with that last statement. It's just that I don't see that phase one <clears throat> as we're we're reducing the multifamily in phase one, but if that was the park, then there's a benefit there. Um, okay, thank you. Um, on page 98, the table 610, the flow chart, um, this was helpful, very helpful that it was added. Um, it, I still am not clear who coordinates, and I don't mean as a project manager, but as sort of an executive overseer, I don't know what term you, I can think of some terms, but they all have words that probably aren't appropriate here. Um, just an executive um, coordinator for for the variety of, of individual subdivision development plans. So who from the development side 
looks at those and says, okay, here's the edge where you're next to, you know, you're in two and you're next to three and we need to make sure that this is cohesive or is the developer putting that on the city to do? I don't, I don't see how these individual subdivision development plans have an overview. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Jeff Barfield again. I'll give it a go. Uh, try to explain this a little bit further. Um, I think in terms of the major roadways and, and I think what you referred to as the common areas, the, the streetscapes and those kind of prominent corner uh, corners to the major streets, I think we've handled that with pretty much a directive that you follow that landscape uh, plan as indicated in Appendix D. Um, you are correct that on the interior, the local streets, we have provided the individual developers a little bit more flexibility, but you know we feel that the design guide, well, I'll start with the design standards, which must be followed. They are fairly clear, uh, clearly written in the document as, and then the, the design guidelines are those additional attributes that can help the staff, the DRC and your commission make that consistency finding. So I think it starts with one, the developer wants to do the best project that he can. And, and of course, you know, get the highest price, the, you know, you know, those kinds of things that the market will bear. So I think he wants to do a good job and not, you know, not contradict the subdivision next to him or her. Uh, and then, um, you know, from, from, from that point, I think, the design then develops and staff, of course, has a very integral part in that review. And I think, I mean, I know I've been, I've been held to each of those statements and design standards before. So um, I'm hoping that answers your question. Those, the tentative subdivision maps and those development plans, they do come in concurrently. And um, I think they do call for a lot more detail that you will see when they come in. Okay. Um, in the development agreement, um, page 683, it discusses that if nonprofit or government developers take over, I believe this was for the affordable housing, I'm reading from my own notes, um, if that is an option for the developers to assign some of the housing to nonprofit or government developers. If that happens, and my question is for both, but probably even more so for a government developer, I'm not sure who that is, but I believe that was the wording. Would all the elements and requirements of the specific plan remain or would there be a uh, special consideration or an overriding of the local requirements? I, I, I was just unclear. I get the nonprofit, but I was unclear about what a government agency would, would be in that capacity. So Madam Chair, any development with this area uh, area will have to be consistent with a specific plan regardless of who's developing it. Um, it's possible that if a nonprofit came in and proposed say a density bonus project there might be some changes in density as well as maybe some other concessions that they might request under the state density bonus. Um, but either way all that would be packaged into a development plan ultimately um, reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission. All right. And then, um, uh, let's see, 684 uh, in the development agreement section. It, it states that um, lots with ADUs are subject to reduced setback standards. Is that in conformance with the existing zoning for the rest of the city? And I understand this is a specific plan. It, it becomes its own zoning. but. Is that more advantageous to owners developing their own ADU than it would be for, for owners in the rest of the city? Uh, Lisa Wise, do you want to handle that one? I'm not sure about the requirements for the rest of the city. Um, I mean, setbacks now have been reduced under state law to a, a, a maximum of four feet. So I'm not sure what the requirements are on the rest of the city, but the state has reduced setbacks um, for ADUs, like they've reduced a lot of requirements. I'm not sure if, um, uh, Commissioner, that answers your question. Mm, 
partly. I mean, I I understand that the state has you know lots of things to say about ADUs, and I totally understand that. But and I I didn't have I didn't look this up, but my recollection was there were certain setbacks for ADUs in the other areas of the city that were um, not reduced specifically for ADUs, but. If that's a state standard, then I would probably stand corrected. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to go back and look at the city regulations, but if they're not in compliance with state law, you need to uh, you need to follow the state requirements on ADUs until until the local regulations are updated. Okay, so this is specifically. Lot, when it says lots with ADUs subject to reduced setback standards, this specifically is referring to California state standards, right? Yeah, are you looking? Can you give not, me not just the opportunity for the developer or the homeowner who's ever doing it to come in and say, well, I would like to reduce my setback to X? No, they don't have to. You don't have to reduce it more than state law. So it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a zero lot line or anything like that. Do you think this is worth fixing the wording on this so it's more clear. Yeah, we can do that. I'm not sure the page number though, I'm sorry, that you're looking at. Um, so this I is part to... of the development agreement. So this is probably actually yeah. for Matt. Matt, are you following it's, this? Uh, yeah, section... I guess I'm not exactly sure which page we are in here. It's um, uh, page 23 oh, of the, excuse yeah. me, it's page 23 of the development agreement, 3.1.2.2, or I beg your pardon, 3.1.2.2, uh, I think that last one's three, I had two notes together. Yeah, I think it's the last sentence of section 3.1.2.3, .3, Commissioner, and here we're reflecting both that the reduced setbacks are only those as um, required by state law and is reasonably approved by the community development director. So you're correct that the, that the text here is um, doesn't have that direct citation to state law, which we can certainly add. And I will make a note to add in the reasonably approved by the CDD will cite the uh, relevant portion of government code section uh, 65852.2 that governs um, ADUs. So we, we can add that point. Thank you. I appreciate it. That'll be much more clear. <clears throat> okay. And then my last question is, um, unfortunately, back to the police and fire. I'm still confused. And my confusion doesn't have to, I believe I understand the funding and I appreciate that. I'm not sure I did before, but I believe I understand that. Um, and that sounds fine. What I'm not clear about is timing. If we start build, if Beachwood developers start building, and their um, uh, special district is formed and they start selling houses and that starts getting funded, it's still going to be a long time before there's enough money to hire another staff person in police or fire or certainly to build a fire station. And if the sales tax passes, I appreciate that would either solve it or certainly expedite things. But if it doesn't pass, we still have the same, as far as I can see, the same number of police, same number of fires, same number of engines, same number of fire stations, and we're building more houses. Is So my confusion is on timing. So if you could explain that for me, I'd really be appreciative. Kuda, would you want to start the, on that answer, please? Uh, absolutely, Tom. Kuda uh, Wikwede with the DTA. Um, so typically when we're looking at uh, impacts of projects on, on the city, uh, we look at them at, uh, at, at build out. And the idea is as development occurs, um, there will be certain needs uh, that are uh, created by those developments. But those needs uh, occur over time. Uh, we've identified uh, certain thresholds that are needed for each of the departments. We've worked closely uh, in developing the fiscal impact analysis uh, to to come up with uh, exactly what impacts we expect from uh, the project uh, to each of the departments. But 
the mechanism that we're using, which is a um, community facilities district that pays for services. Uh, it basically generates dollars once those units are built. And the idea there is that as once a homeowner moves into that unit, they begin to pay their essentially fair share of uh, those services and those dollars are collected by the city. So uh, over time, uh, those dollars accumulate and are available to, to fund uh, all the eligible services, but we, we don't get those dollars up front because you know, the, the dollars are tied to residents actually uh, moving into those homes. And uh, another point I'll, I'll just make on, on sort of the, 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 at least the framework of the fiscal impact analysis, uh, the impact of the project as a whole, I think, is, uh, is clear uh, per the analysis that we prepared. Uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, approximately $775 per unit per year. Uh, that impact uh, accumulates over over time. So to get to that uh, total impact, the entire development has to happen. And obviously, as certain units are built, uh, we're hitting certain thresholds. We we need a, 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 a you know a, an additional police officer, or we need a, an additional firefighter, um, or we need to. Uh, it, increase our level of service on, on library or anything like that. Those are happening over time, but this, the, the mechanism that we've, uh, we're have we relying on uh, is simply tied to actual individuals moving in. So we're, we, we may not necessarily catch um, triggers as they happen, but the idea eventually is that the project as a whole uh, provides that fiscal neutrality for, for the city. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to make just a quick sweep back through the commissioners, see if you have any other questions. Again, just questions, and then we'll start our, our deliberations. So, Commissioner Kogler? Uh, no further questions. All right, Commissioner Davis? Yes, I, I think I'll follow up on the police um, since we've just been talking about it. I, I guess. My question to staff is, to city staff, is that um, if we are having a current deficiency in terms of our police and fire, um, and, and if, as the consultant indicates, over time there will be funding, it seems in the term we're going to maybe strain our community. Um, how, how do you respond to that if the sales tax does not pass? So this is, uh, I'll address that. <clears throat> if the sales tax measure does not pass, we will, as these homes develop, have to make cuts in other service areas unless the voters choose in 2024 or 2026 to recognize the shortfall and approve a measure. Um, part of the challenge is exactly what you're talking about is the mismatch of timing of the development and timing of the necessary revenues to cover a full position or in the case of a uh, police closer to four or five positions to cover a shift 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There is no other mechanism that enables us to address that timing other than shifts within our own budget or recognition by the community as a whole that pulling police away from um, existing residents is going to hurt everyone um, in addition to those people um, living in the development if, if we don't pull police away from other areas. so. For instance, fire station three and fire engine three, they are designed to be able to provide the response capacity for new developments in the community. But once the, once the, the uh, federal grant expires, 
if we don't have a, a sales tax measure or others, some other similar measure, we won't be providing the level of service the original part of the community needs and requires. It's not a good answer, but it is the answer that's available to us under the systems we yeah. have. I think it's safe to say, um, Mr. Fuji, that we all want police and service levels guaranteed for both our existing residents and certainly any future residents of this project. I think we not only just want adequate police and fire, we want ample police and fire. Um, and, I, and it just puts us in, a, uh, at least me, in a nervous situation without their ways. I, I just don't want to put an unduly strain on our um, police and fire forces. Um, I I think we've talked quite a bit about this. I know there's, there's a political element with the um, sales tax being on our upcoming ballot, but it is part of the equation and I, I had to bring it up. Um, I'd like to go back to, um, and this is probably a question to you, Warren, on the housing element. Um, our staff report for July 28th on page five says changes in the housing element are necessary to reflect the addition of 237 surplus density units towards Beechwood. Has has this been done yet? It's my understanding the housing element is not yet approved. Yeah, so surplus density units is an item that was created by the city council in 2013. Um, it was an acknowledgement that there was a certain number of units build out population that had never been actually allocated to any property in town. So those units were identified and then the council went through a process of allocating those to different projects. 237 of those surplus density units were allocated to this project, which then allowed the project to move through the EIR process, analyzing the 911 units. That is the project that's before you for consideration tonight. So the council in 2018 took action to allocate those 237 um, extra or surplus density units to this project. So uh, are you saying, Warren, that it's in our current housing element? So it's in your current general plan. Um, it's not in the housing element per se, um, but as we update the housing element, it will reflect whatever the adopted general plan designation is for this property. So that is resolution B tonight, which is the land use um, updates. Those table updates will um, change the density of this property to 911 units if it's approved, and then that will also be reflected in the housing element. Yeah, I, I realize that the council allocated the 237 surplus density units to be studied in the EIR, I, I get that. Um, however, my question to you um, is this does use up all the surplus density units for the city. Um, if we use all the remaining available surplus density units for Beechwood, will there be any in the future for other projects in the city? I could envision maybe a real creative or innovative housing project that might want one as well, or a few as well. Um, could you respond to that? Yeah, since 2018, um, all the surplus density units have been allocated. So Currently, we do not have any surplus units to allocate to a project. Um, when we reviewed the draft housing element last week, one of the policies of the new housing element was to apply fractional density units to multifamily areas. That would have the potential to create about 350 additional let's call them surplus density units, um, kind of the phase two of that. So as we move forward with housing element adoption, um, hopefully by early next year, we'll probably have another 300 or so surplus density units available for projects again. Okay, my question is what, I, and so there is potential for more in the future. I, my question, I guess, is if, if we're using that all up, why do we put it all in one basket? There might be some other innovative projects out there, but you're saying maybe in another year there are more projects available, more dense surplus density units available. 
Yeah, that, this you know, the surplus density unit allocation is a council discretionary item. The council was aware that we were going to be exhausting all those units when they were allocated to Beechwood. The council made that decision knowing that. Um, the council, through the Housing Constraints and Opportunity Committee, um, was interested in creating more surplus density units, so that's what we're working on right now. Okay, thanks, Warren. Um, is David in David Alfie present? I have a traffic. I'm here, question. Commissioner. Hi, how are you, David? Good evening. Okay, good evening. Um, we've read about, we've heard from staff the assort from you, the assorted traffic mitigations for 911 units. Um, but there's this statement of our overriding considerations. And I, I remember I asked this of you um, before, um, but with the additional traffic from the project in question, for example, I, I talk to me about um, a, a, an impacted intersection like Niblick first and spring. I, I think I asked this one time before, if I am on Niblick Bridge and I am turning on um, Spring to go southbound 101, so I'm turning left, with this project, um, how much longer am I going to be queued? I see a lot of um, significant and unavoidable queuing impacts throughout the, uh, the traffic report. So. How much, how much impact? Give me a sense of that. How much longer? So uh, we have Michelle Matson here, who is from Central Coast Traffic Consulting, and, and uh, we can get you an exact, no, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I, in, in the previous reports uh, that we did for the old Chandler project, it was about five seconds of additional delay on average uh, at the intersection, um, we can get a we can get an exact number here for you in a second. Um, okay, but that that is typical for Niblick Road. We're not talking a huge amount of delay, but there is additional delay, and uh, there is no there is no way to take that additional delay. Uh, however, part of the project is at, at South River and um, Niblick installing. Uh, new traffic signal technology that allows the traffic signal to react in, in, in real time to different traffic conditions, uh, increasing efficiency and keeping traffic going and reduce, reducing um, uh, congestion. So that's, yeah, that was that was helpful with the adaptive signal, the explanation of that. That that helped a lot. I um I, I know we can't this is what I'm struggling with. I know we can't do much um, at those areas um, where we have traffic impacts if it involves Caltrans, but you know, at build out with the level of density, I'm looking at how we can swallow these significant and unavoidable impacts. Right. That's so the reason, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so on, on Highway 46 and US 101, the reason why those are significant and unavoidable is because we cannot control Caltrans. We cannot ensure that the any improvement that would be required of the developer would be able to be completed, which would put them in conflict with their with the EIR. So in the case is we're requiring, uh, in, the, in the case of this project, we're requiring them to pay their traffic mitigation fees that would go towards, you know, so they got to do as much as they can and, and we control that. So we're having them pay their traffic impact fees uh, towards towards those impacts. And the city is currently working on a new overpass at Union Road and, and be a, a future airport. Uh, so we are actively working on projects to uh, that will benefit the Highway 46 East Corridor and currently the US 101 corridor, Caltrans has no plans at, at this point to um, you know, do physical improvements. They are working with, Cal with uh, excuse me, with Slowcog to come up with um, 
reducing congestion by increasing uh, busing and other types of ride sharing and uh, congestion management practice. So we'll, the city will also continue to work with, with Caltrans on both those highways uh, to ensure that, you know, we, we, we minimize our impact as much as possible and also be, we're part of the solution out there. Yeah, I, I like the fact that there's that airport extension, but if we think about build out and I know in your crystal ball, can what kind of timeline on the um, overpass at Airport Road? You know, I, I'm going to have to um, refer to Dick McKinley uh, on the exact timeline, but we're looking at, uh, you know, it's, it's my current knowledge would be the next uh, 10 to 20 years time frame. Um, it's currently not funded for construction, but we are moving forward with the environmental portion in order to get the to get that done and move on to the next step in the in the design process. So this is Dick McKinley. We are in the process right now of acquiring the property that we would need for that spot. Um, we are uh, have some design concepts through the PAD process, which we're working on through Caltrans to all do all the plans, the environmental documents and stuff, gone through and evaluated options and things like that. So the next thing that would happen, there's a little bit more right away to get, but the next thing would happen is to coordinate the extension of Airport Road, which this project helps to extend, but the coordination of uh, the extension of Airport Road through uh, South Chandler and then through North Chandler and then that will give the drive to get the grants to build the overpass at the Union Road overpass over Highway 46. So I'm going to say anywhere from three years to 10 years, depending on how fast development goes. All right. Thank you, Dad. Um, another question separate from traffic. Um, uh, Warren, how about this? The local preferences, the July 28th staff report on page nine says the applicant is to give preference to local labor and buyers. How is this done and how is this enforced? Yes, that's part of the development agreement. It was a condition that was also added to the Olson South Chandler specific plan. I'll have uh, Matt Summers uh, kind of walk us through how that works. Certainly, Commissioners, Commissioner Davis, this is covered in Exhibit H uh, to the development agreement. And the base program is a three step program for local buyers and local, or two step program for local buyers and local workers. For local buyers, it calls for a 30 day marketing period where the developers agree to spend the first 30 days of marketing focusing on uh, channels and tools that will reach local buyers, local defined as folks in the northern portion of San Luis Obispo County. Um, and then for anyone who signs up to join the interest list and is local, the developer agrees that for that first 30 day period, they will um, make it available to make a, a given unit available to persons on that list who then get notified that they have 30 days to become qualified and to, to confirm their status as a buyer. So it doesn't say that the developers cannot sell to someone who's not local for the first 30 days. Rather, it says that if uh, a buyer is local, then they get at least 30 days to qualify after uh, being notified that the product that they want is so available. Uh, but we, and we aren't getting in, you know, they still have to confirm their credit worthiness and appropriate funds, et cetera, they have to qualify, still must qualify. But it, it's about giving a, a first opportunity for local buyers to buy. Uh, it also requires a variety of, of outreach efforts and um, at least four events during those 30 day windows for promoting the availability of local businesses. And it's intended to apply in each phase uh, as if as each phase is made available um, the first, the first units in each phase. The uh, second portion of it is a local worker requirement. This is intended to have the development community that are that is the developers, their 
master builders, the sub builders, and so on down the train, provide notice of availability for um, contracting opportunities and for working opportunities to uh, local local workers, local local builders, local um, tradespersons, and to develop a plan for how they're going to provide that specific marketing to local workers and builders. As for how this is to be enforced, the program, the intention is that at the time a builder applies for the first building permit for a particular phase, the developer must provide their plan for compliance with the local preference program requirements. And then the city would review and approve that and confirm that it's acceptable at the first building permit for each phase. And it is the same as it, both here and in the Olson South Channel specific plan project. Thank you. A um, couple quick follow-up questions. Is 30 days for a buyer, a local buyer, is that pretty much industry standard? This kind of a program isn't exactly industry standard to start with. Um, I, I know I'm aware of a couple of other communities have done this, and those that I've aware, uh, I'm aware of have also used a 30-day program. Um, as for whether that's typical for an, a traditional interest list in a buyer qualification period, I'll refer that back to the development team. But I will say this was modeled on a program we also advised on for, um, and my mind just went blank, the, I believe it was the city of Beach. Um, had a similar program, and that's where we drew the 30-day period from. Okay, and then we'll talk about the different phases. I think it comes back to um, Chairwoman Jorgensen's question about an overall, uh, I don't know what the coordinator, would each phase do their own programming? The agreement is Structure to allow that. It also would allow coordinated operations among the phases. We've left that open, reflecting that we aren't sure whether we're going to have each phase developed by individual builders or uh, master builders coming in and buying up two, three phases or two, three current current ownership groups phases and then developing them as a larger block. Um, so we've we've left that somewhat flexible. But the test is each phase that comes in the first building permit. That's when we test it. And then okay. we'll, we'll require compliance as they move through and develop the phase. All right, thank you. Um, I have, I think it's one more question, if that's okay, um, Chair, um, Chair Jorgensen, one more. Yes, um, okay. Uh, regarding Creston Road and the Gateway. I know we're planning a city monument and I'm pleased to see the, the changed language um, that the developer um, provides funding for the monument, but the, the city reviews it and comes up with the design. <clears throat> My question in terms of the gateway is this, with that commercial com component there, I, I guess I'm kind of perplexed about that. As you're coming in the gateway to pass the rubbles, you see a pretty, um, Abrupt. There's really no transition. I know there's that open space there, but a pretty abrupt um, movement into pretty compact design, and 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 you see the the residential or the commercial component and the multifamily is the first thing you see. I'm not sure that's the best gateway. I, that's just, do you have a comment on that? So I think, uh, Madam Chair, we'll refer that to the applicant to explain the design, but we do have a transition, obviously, from rural to urban coming in. Um, there is commercial um, with a landscape feature to kind of aid in that transition. I don't know if Lisa or Jeff, you want to kind of explain exactly how it's designed? Well, let me, uh, Warren, this is uh, Madam Chair Dan Lloyd. You're always, you're always going to have a, an issue when you have a hard urban edge from going from rural character to urban character. I wouldn't necessarily characterize that location as inappropriate because the housing is up on a hill above the commercial. 
The commercial itself on the, the, two, the two corners of where Airport Road is going to intersect Creston Road, that is going to have its own identity, but it's not going to be intense. Uh, it just it, it's not going to have scale of of a high urban edge. So how that sign is or whatever it wants to be, and I'll just say that that design is a concept and not necessarily a dictum. That is going to be something that the city will grapple with at the time we bring in uh, the project for construction of that gateway sign. So there are other things that we can do to, you want to call it landscaping or uh, siting, that may help that be less abrupt. And one thing that could be done, and I, I have talked about this with uh, PG&E, is you could put that sign uh, within the PG&E easement. It's not a, it's not a structure of, uh, it's not a habitable structure. It's something that will perhaps give it a little bit more of a standalone quality because it isn't so directly associated with uh, the development within the project. That's something we could always explore, but I don't think we could ever guarantee that PG&E would be happy to accommodate us. So I'm going to fall back into um, the fact that it's not a very large sign, but we have to do something to emphasize that you've arrived at the city in some fashion. So rather than design it today, we've identified let's do something, and I think that your, your commission as well as DRC will have the first bite at that uh, opportunity. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yeah, that, that's it for right now, um, um, Commissioner, um, Chair Jorgensen, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Neal, do you have a uh, second round of questions? A quick comment and a question. Um, on the development agreement, item 1.7.2, I think it also references um, section numbers uh, inappropriately or diff incorrectly, so you may want to take a gander at 1.7.2 in the development agreement. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. I agree. We will make those uh, corrections. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question on the commercial flex low rise. Um, based on what I am looking at on the design standards and followed up from the design guidelines, it seems that this could be built as a typical kind of strip mall front loaded parking along Creston and potentially um, DS34 may very much lend itself to that. Um, is there a prohibition for a front loaded um, kind of a commercial area here? So let me take a first crack at that. The way the um, site's designed, um, there won't be any access directly off Creston Road. All the access has to come off of Airport Road here and here. We end up with landscaped uh, features and detention basins along the frontage here. Um, so that will prevent your standard strip kind of commercial with a parking lot um, straight against the street with the buildings behind that. I think with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa Wise and she can kind of explain how the uh, design guidelines work for this product type. Thank you, Warren. Um, yeah, so Commissioner, I think you're right, though. It's DS-34 that really prohibits that because it clearly states, and this is a standard, that buildings must be oriented towards a public street. Um, if, if that was the intent of that standard, um, that's why it's there. Well, I don't agree that it prohibits it. I think it requires that it points either towards the buildings point towards um, the major streets and doesn't create, you know, kind of a sense of place interior to that development, um, which would then, I think, potentially 
move that parking along Creston Road and maybe um, along the other um, accesses. Um, I'm just not sure that this particular um, commercial flex low rise design standards or guidelines uh, limits the ability or limits the fact that it can be built as a typical strip mall. It's just my comment. Thank you. All right. Um, Commissioner Gibson, do you have uh, more questions? Uh, I have no additional questions at this time. Thanks. All right. And I do not have any additional questions either. So, um, I guess it is time that we begin our deliberations. And uh, I know that we've, some of us have had sort of comments while we're asking questions, but it's now time to get down to what we would request to see changed, if anything, and how we would like to have that done and what we, um, how we would like to see if we can move this project forward. So Commissioner Kogler, would you like to begin our discussion? Uh, certainly, Madam Chair, thank you. Where to begin? Um, first of all, I would genuinely compliment all the parties that are involved, the city staff, the owners, the developers representative, the consultants, because working with multiple landowners like this to come up with a plan and to be able to, to all the synchronization that needs to happen to make this lay out in some, some path that makes sense is quite a task. And I think they've ably handled that. And, and I, I think the plan has been very well uh, thought out. Indicators of that certainly in my mind are the, the lack of tree loss uh, that's occurred relatively minimal, I'd say very minimal on a 235 acre site. Um, the standards and guidelines that have been put forward, I think are a reasonable framework for, for guiding this. Um, you know, Commissioner Neal's last comment was one that I'm, I'm kind of still concerned a little bit of in some cases on this, I have to kind of put myself in the mode of, of we can still address that as a planning commission, as a DRC as time goes on. It seems clearly the key question here is that the planning commission has to, to peg a number of units. Uh, the 911 that's being proposed, the 250 that, that Mr. Frace referenced as being kind of the minimal environmental, but for a lot of ways not very workable. The 674 that were originally um, proposed as a part of this in the general plan. And I think the the plan in its totality makes me comfortable that the 911 units can work, um, first off. I think it does provide varied housing products in here, uh, some of which at least in new housing aren't available in the community today, be it a, a cottage home or an alley home product or something like that. Um, I do think it will make a significant contribution to the city's supply of affordable housing. Uh, regardless of which option is picked and, and the ADUs that are part of this. The things that I'm not uncomfortable with, but not totally comfortable with either, uh, are really just down to a couple of things. The This whole ability to fund the added public safety improvements and services that are necessary um, leaves me just a little bit, a little bit of angst. I, I realize this is going to take a number of years to build out, but I also realize this isn't the last specific plan in the pipeline either. And so that, that whole arena of public safety, public services, adequate personnel, adequate protection uh, is a lingering concern. The mixed use uh, piece of this, which was on the screen a few moments ago, um, I would hope could somehow be kind of a mixed use. I know there's talk of allocation of some of the residential units that came out of a portion of what would have been a downsized community park, if you will, may be able to be allocated here. I think doing something in a horizontal mixed use configuration just economically is gonna be very challenging on this site, but if something like that could happen, it, it could be a plus. Um, I share to a degree Commissioner Davis's concern about the abrupt nature of going from rural to urban but um, I think that transition, again, can probably be managed over time with the designs that are yet to come for some of the subsequent phases and specific tracks of the project, as well as specifically this uh, the mixed-use area, be it commercial in, in its totality or maybe having some residential as a part of that. So um, in, a, in a rambling way, perhaps, I'm, I'm coming back to 
I think it, it's a reasonable development for the site. There are questions. I think there's always going to be questions on some of these things. But I do believe there are things that, that the city will be able to manage over time. Um, I certainly don't want to minimize traffic. We spent a lot of time on traffic last time. And, and I think, again, the, the overarching improvements that are to be earmarked as a part of this and future projects will, will help. Um, it, it certainly isn't going to avoid some additional congestion, some additional queuing and things in the future. So I think the bottom line is I'm comfortable with the plan. Um, I think we've discussed all of the aspects of it. And uh, I think when time comes, I will be able to be in a position to vote on all of the resolutions that we need to go through to make this happen. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. All right, thank you. All right. Um, I'm for development. Oh, I think I've lost you. Okay, are, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm for development, especially good development, and I really do like the uh, diverse housing types in this project. I have some concerns about traffic impacts, and um, I'm especially concerned about funding the police and fire for our existing residents and future residents for this project. Um, I am concerned about the abrupt nature from rural to urban. I think one of the critical things, and I didn't hear Mark bring this up, I'd like to hear your, your opinion about this, but I am a little uncomfortable using all of those um, surplus density units to this one project. And um, while I'm in favor of the project, at large, I'd like to see less density. I'd maybe like to cut the uh, surplus density in half. It's an idea that I had to try to minimize some of the impacts that this has in the community. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Neal. Thank you, Chair for some Parkinson. I am um, supportive of the number of units, the 911. I think um, it, the traffic impact, the way the city is, is going to um, be significant or close to significant um, for much of what we do on these sites. And then we do need the additional housing. I think it's important for a city to grow. Um, where I'm not so comfortable is, and, and actually, frankly, I was a bit shocked on the um, uh, specific plan, the wholesale change, what I felt was a wholesale change in the um, design um, standards. Um, I don't think there's enough there for uh, a, a really a cohesive um, development. And so for that reason, I am supportive of the uh, development for the the number of units, the general plan amendment, the zoning change, I will not be able to support the specific plan or the development agreement. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gibson. Um, I, I tend to concur with some of the other comments uh, from my uh, fellow commissioners that overall, um, you have to commend the uh, people that have worked to put this together with the different ownerships and the different groups. Um, I, I, I just kind of share my, my, my thoughts, I guess, is that um, I, I have a concern about the uh, significant concern about the um, traffic impact. And, and I appreciate David's uh, comments about the interactive, um, signals, but I just don't believe that we're, we're, you know, that some of the comments, for example, that um, that what's going to happen on the 13th Street corridor, as example, is going to be take us back to pre-project levels of traffic. I just already, because I use South River Road going north and trying to turn on to 13th Street, sometimes there's, the queuing is full. I mean, even the way it is now. So, 
we're looking long term down the road. I mean, until Airport Road goes all the way from north to south, uh, the interchange in 46 is completed, which nobody really knows how long that's going to take. I think that um, we're going to have significant um, impact on our traffic. Uh, another example would be Niblick is sent as we were told is uh, going to be a 99% capacity. We haven't even finished some major projects that are on the east side. Um, so, but the city needs housing, so it's kind of a balancing act. Um, my suggestion, I'm just going to throw it out, is that I'd like to see the uh, traffic impact done earlier, much earlier than what's suggested. But I, I recognize that um, the the uh, owners and developers need to build up some cash. So I would I would suggest some consideration of some sort of phasing instead of we wait until the 554th home or the you know whatever you know home that we're basically over halfway there that maybe we start earlier we start one at 150 units and one another one at 250 units um, that way that we start mitigating the traffic concerns as we go along um, and that um, we don't have everything torn up all at the same time I mean I, I'm just thinking that we do it the way this is being suggested we're going to have every corridor torn up in construction at the same time which just seems like an absolute disaster to me so um, um, the um, in regards in regards to the uh, park, I would uh, I would suggest that um, again that we have some sort of agreement that it be done way before the uh, the fiftieth or five hundredth unit uh, of occupancy because we already have a huge shortage in terms of um, you know kids and adults uh, being able to do recreation in, in uh, parks so. Um, I would suggest we do that earlier. Um, I, I was actually somewhat startled that uh, when I found uh, in doing some reading, additional reading this last week, that this actually perhaps is not going to be cost neutral because uh, that's how it was sold. Um, and I and I, I'd like to maybe hear some ideas or discussion about how we uh, somehow make this cost neutral if we're not going to tax the 100 units then perhaps the other 811 should pay a little bit more and that ties into what i'm hearing with the concerns about the uh the uh, funding for emergency services and my my last comment is that again i'm just trying to be cognizant and sensitive to the housing needs for everybody in our city and i've found the our um meeting last week highly informative and I, I just noted I made some notes that that some some somewhere in the neighborhood 40 percent or more of our residents are actually what we consider low income and um, yet this project regardless of whatever density we do it at is doesn't even come close to uh, providing 40 percent of our residents any housing so I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I've been assured by staff that there's other areas that this is going to happen. But frankly, the more that we approve large developments that consume huge areas of the town, there's less and less op opportunity to do that. And if we don't provide housing for those 40 percent, we won't have any of those real workers that are in that we rely upon in agriculture, hospitality services. So those are my comments. Thank you. All right, I've been trying to take some notes that may or may not be accurate or complete to cover everyone's um, thoughts of things we may need to further discuss. <clears throat> Let me just run through those quickly and see if there's other things to add. I, I believe all I only have one thing to add, but let me go through this first. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. The specific plan um, that it's it's level of um, specificity, the depth of the of the uh, descriptive nature of it, and perhaps to be more varied will be necessary to really implement this successfully. Um, the traffic and road construction to be, uh, there's concerned about the phasing, simultaneous projects across the city and, and, you know, even adequacy of those projects when they are completed and, and that they may not be 
underway soon enough to make a, di a difference for many years. Um, <clears throat> confirming the moving the park construction earlier, as we previously discussed, coming back again to the ability to fund uh, the necessary uh, staff and, and capital improvements for fire and police. Um, realizing that there's this project, but there's also the um, Olson Chandler project coming up probably in parallel to this. Um, questions about that this project isn't cost neutral, which seemed to be a surprise. Um, is it really adequate for the maybe not officially what we would call affordable housing, but housing in the affordability range for our city and for our citizens? And then um, you can tell me in a minute if what, what I've missed there, but I wanted to add to that <clears throat> my concern that there is there is no um, master development plan here um, that would have general overall concepts for the entire site. Um, and then the um, more uh, specific development plans that could then come in for each each phase. But there's no coordination. I don't hear any coordination plan. And so that puts it back on the city. And my concern is that puts it back on a potential pushback and <sighs> dilemma challenges that are cost, cost ineffective and time ineffective at the various points when these when these plans come in because there is no except for four or five bullet points and a couple of photographs in the specific plan, that's it. And the comment was made, has been discussed tonight about the mixed use, the commercial mixed use, as one enters the gateway into town. And to say that, well, we'll deal with that later, um, I'm just not comfortable with that. I, it doesn't need to be specifically designed. We don't know what the specific design is, and that's not what I'm suggesting, but there needs to be some plan for an overall executive planner from the developer's side or something that will, some things, someone, some designated entity. So when they come to this, when the developers come to the city, all of these pieces are plugged in to a whole. And I don't see that we have that at this point. I don't think there's enough information here to provide that. So um, my suggestion is that we go around one more time. Please let me know what I missed, I probably missed a couple of things and we'll keep our list going and see how we can work this out. So Com Commissioner Kogler, you're up again. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think one of the struggles we're having as a commission, particularly for those of us that are newer members of the commission is our, our really kind of baptism by fire specific plan was the, uh, the last one, the Olson South Chandler. And that one was different in that it spelled out all of the pieces in detail and all of the subsequent plans were in place as a part of that approval, where this one creates a framework for what is to happen. And I think there's a, certainly there is information here that, that's intended to guide and guide the cohesiveness of that occurring. But I don't disagree with my fellow commissioners that are we still lacking in the, the detail of the coordination and maybe some cases the specificity of the uh, the standards themselves. Um, I think the easiest point of reference and for discussing that for me continues to go back to that mixed use piece that we've talked about before. Um, that could be commercial, that could be residential. Um, I think we would all envision something that's not a strip center, um, even though it may take access, not off Creston, it still could look like a strip center from Creston. And I think it's those kinds of things that, that are a bit of sticking points for me and perhaps some of the, the fellow commissioners. And I, I think I need to be comfortable that as this project continues and as these small area tracks come in and as we see more detail, that indeed we have the ability to, and is it our coming up on the city, to manage that, to be consistent and to manage that in a way that meets, I think what we all perceive this as being. So I, I'm not, in a, in a different mode than the rest of the commission is in, in many ways. Um, I think the overall unit count, I, I would go back to again, I think is fine. It's the devil's in details on this. And with this manner of approval of this one, we don't have many of those details yet as we enjoyed last time with the last large specific plan that we reviewed. 
That's my latest reaction. Okay, thank manager. you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Neal? I, I don't have anything to add. I think uh, Commissioner Kogler said, said what I was trying to say very well. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Commissioner Davis, I skipped, went out of order. No, that's fine. I, uh, I think uh, my growing concern is that the project isn't cost neutral. And that's, uh, you know, I've always been concerned about police and fire, but uh, making sure that this project pays its fair share is, is kind of um, on my mind. Um, I, I hear Commissioner Jorgensen on the executive planning part. I'm not quite sure how you coordinate all of this. I think that's um, a bit confusing. I'm not even sure that the 9-11 is the number that I'm comfortable with, with the impacts that it has on, uh, on the community. So um, I'm open to ideas. All right, um, Commissioner Gibson. I'll, I'll just uh, maybe echo echo two type comments. It, it had occurred to me, I, I actually, because I, I drive that uh, Creston Road corridor uh, frequently, uh, sometimes two or three, four times a week, that it occurred to me that actually is a gateway, just like every other gateway to the city. And I and I and so I share the concern uh, that I'm hearing that that gateway uh, not be a strip mall or be something that we would be proud of uh, to be representative of the city. And uh, it had also uh, occurred to me, although I, uh, I heard it put uh, much more succinctly by, uh, uh, by uh, a couple of my fellow commissioners about, I'm not, I was uh, curious how, when you had distinctly different styles of housing that is being proposed, you know, how you actually coordinate that. I mean, so you have a, a block of Mediterranean, and then you have a block of farmhouses. I mean, I just, I was just trying to kind of scratch my head, like how that normally is done. I appreciate the styles. I just, I, it just seemed like somehow, uh, maybe to echo your own thoughts, uh, Madam Chairwoman, is that uh, I just was wondering how something like that actually gets coordinated so that it flows and you don't end up uh, having like, uh, you know, different distinct blocks that don't, um, uh, blend in from one block to the other. Thank you. All right, maybe um, at this point we could ask the applicant if they could um, address how this will all get pulled together. I think you've heard some significant concern from another of the, a number of the commissioners. How do you see this working? Because obviously we're not, many of us are not convinced. Madam Chair, Dan Lloyd, um, I'd love to take a stab at this. The first thing I want to say is with respect to mixed use and the commercial com uh, component of the project, we're dealing with a total maximum of 47,000 square feet. Do you realize that that's smaller than an Albertsons market? So it's going to be broken up into three areas if you look at the site plan. In area I, the largest parcel is for affordable housing. So we're gonna have, some, and that's the furthest away from the gateway coming from the east progressing northwest. So that's on, on the other side of that street. So we're gonna have small commercial. So it's gonna be more like, not a strip mall. I, I think that's a, a, not a fair comparison at all because we simply don't have the density. Another thing to consider along that, front, that frontage of Creston Road, the frontage of those commercial pieces are going to have drainage basins along the front. So they're going to be actually landscaped features set back from the street right of way, which is further distanced from the, from the, the road by our meandering multi-use path. So I think we might be fearing more about what it's going to look like than some of the actual physical characteristics. And again, topographically, the site rises up behind the commercial. And so you're going to have, and again, a landscape buffer between the commercial and the, and the residential component uh, up on the hill. 
that's further going to accentuate diversity of the streetscape and land and building form. And I think those are going to be two very important comments or, or factors that will mitigate what you might consider to be the hard urban edge or this monotony of commercial development. That's one component. I think the, the fallacy of the Olson plan that you're all enamored with is that there is, those folks, in my professional opinion, have boxed themselves into a design and that design is going to get stale going forward. And if you look at any community, architecture evolves. Styles change. And while you get comfort in a style that is homogeneous and it's consistent and it's predictable, I fear that it's, they're going to come back and say, I want to change it. Because absorption for that many units, and I want you to think about this with respect to Beechwood as well, absorption is going to be over time. So what we have done is we've taken a palette of streetscape, multi-use path, basins, walls, and we've created a continuity of feel as you traverse through the communities on the on the major streets that we have and then you have the opportunity to create diversity and identity within the individual components phase 1a phase 1b phase 2 and frankly people like to see diversity and a lot of developers will put multiple if you think about some of the most beautiful neighborhoods you've ever been in they are developments that are based on, let's call it, I, I won't, I'll use the term spec house, but somebody building their own house with their own, air, their own architectural style for their own lot. And those neighborhoods with the streetscape and the bike path and different architecture actually create something unique and more pleasing and less repetitive and monotonous. I think we have to get away from the idea that everything needs to look the same all the time. And, you know, the old, was it, uh, uh, the old song, they all look like ticky-tacky and, and you know, they all look just the same. They're all made of ticky-tacky and they all, that was, a, what was her name? Uh, the, you know, it's, uh, oh, okay, God, I almost got it. So I think I, I would like to bring you back from the, the edge of thinking that this is not going to be well thought out and recognize that in terms of scale, particularly for the commercial, and you have to have the commercial along Creston Road because there's, otherwise it's not, going to, it's not going to be successful, period. Um, and that's just been proven out over time and time again. So what you have, I think, is the uniqueness of, I'll just say phase 1A uh, is that's going to have a style, and it's separated by open space on to, to the east. And then phase 1B, just to the west of Airport Road, that's made up of two different ownerships, but they're going to be developing that as one homogeneous idea. Area F on the west side, on the east side of Airport Road at Metal Arc, that will have its own identity. Area H is going to have its own identity. It's a little bit different than area A and B and C. So I think I look forward to the, the, the continuity of driving into the community with these walls and this common palette of landscaping and basins, and then going into the uniqueness along with different lot sizes, which creates the opportunity for affordability, affordability with character and uniqueness so that it doesn't all become just kind of blah. And I'll just, I'll just share with you, you know, another subdivision that I uh, have been involved with for years. The second phases, third phase, fourth phase, they change. 
And they change because the public changes. What the public demands is different. And so I think we have an opportunity here to create continuity, but yet allow the expression of time to reflect, be reflected in the architecture and what people want. This COVID process that we're going through also creates, you know, a, a different feeling. People now want to have their office in their home. So they want more bedrooms. That's really kind of a factor. They want smaller, but more bedrooms. And that's what we have to be aware of. So I wouldn't be disillusioned by the, the concern that it's, it, that you can't define it all today. That's, the, that's why you have architects and you have planners that work with what is necessary going forward today. I, I, I don't share the, the pessimism that I'm hearing with you because I'm an optimist. I'm looking for solutions, not looking for solutions. I believe solutions will be found through the cooperative process of the planning staff, planning commission, and the city council going forward with these individual subdivisions. I, I don't want to. I don't want to push back too hard against what you're saying. But as we move, we take our current thought. And let's say two years, four years, eight years. We'll take those things and and, and what we've learned and go. Yeah, let's do this. I think we've got something special here. That's the way I'm looking at the whole thing. Think about the Thank streetscape you. setting. It. So, Madam Chair, maybe if staff could weigh in really quickly on this. Yeah, um, please. It seems like please. a lot of the comments that the commission expressed really are related to this area right here. Let's see if this is going to work for me. Here we go. All right. So, this Creston Road corridor. Um, and the gateway feature here um, is obviously key. This area that's shown in purple, that's the mixed use area. So that's about 46,000 square feet of commercial with the potential to mix in residential. Here's the basin, the open space feature, and then the gateway features here. There's another stormwater basin feature here. Come up to the secondary street. This is one of the affordable housing sites. This is an apartment complex at 20 units the acre. And then beyond that, we have another water quality open space feature along here. I think because this is phase two and it's furthest out and it's hard to really determine right now what the demand is for commercial development, this area of the plan is um, not as well detailed as some of the other sections of the plan. So we've talked about that there's these intermediate development plans that are required to go through both DRC and the Planning Commission. I think one way we could kind of deal with how we create cohesiveness and organization, because I think along Creston Road is where that issue is most acute, is we could add a policy to the specific plan that a single development plan be approved for the entire Creston corridor prior to any development. At that point then, when that happens, um, we'll obviously have a project proposed and we can look at all these pieces at the same time, make sure the guidelines, the streetscape, the uh, rural um, urban edge transition, the gateway feature, all of those are designed in a cohesive manner. So I think it would be fairly easy to add that policy. I think that would definitely improve the project. And I think that would answer what I heard as, a, as kind of a, a theme among a lot of the questions. Thank you, Mr. Freese. That makes good sense for that <clears throat> one part of the uh, development area. Um, I just wanted to respond to some of the comments that some of the words I wrote down were <clears throat> that I didn't hear at all from the Planning Commission was sameness, uh, boring, pessimistic. Um, I didn't hear any of that. I heard that we wanted cohesive planning, that we wanted transitional, um, uh, a tr way to be transitional between the different phases, between the different areas, between the different building types. It's the uh, specific plan itself has been taken now from, was it six style types to only three? Um, I don't think we expressed that we were too pleased with that. That makes it much more 
uh, same, if that's the word we want to use. So I'm, I'm not sure we were heard there. So I guess we're going to have to keep talking about this. So in terms of the architectural appendix A, there were some additional architectural um, styles um, that were proposed. If the commission wants to add those back in, um, I think that you could definitely keep those um, in the specific plan if, if that's desired. Um, let's see, why don't we take these rather than going around, why don't we take them by, by topic? Um, <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Neil, you had talked about the specific plan uh, itself, or did you want to address any other comments to that or, or any thoughts that came from the applicant's comments? Well, um, I, w I was, I agreed with some of what the applicant was saying, but did not agree with much of it. Um, I think uh, what I feel is some of the most beautiful um, subdivisions that have been done in California um, were done with a very similar palette, and that's um, the Eichler subdivisions. I think they're uh, timeless uh, and uh, have a very similar palette. And what was done in the early late 50s, early 60s is still current and still appropriate today. So I think, yes, architecture does evolve, but good architecture is good architecture forever. Um, I think my, uh, I think to say that I was only concerned with the um, commercial was a bit um, a narrowing of my concern. Um, I, if And I was trying to find it, but I couldn't located quickly but i believe even in the large lot subdivision that we have different owner uh across the street or next door to particular in particular lots i mean across the street a different owner can start or next door a different owner can start um so we could see a wholesale completely different uh streetscape from what it sounded like because the owner could change their um uh, street trees and street landscaping within the subdivision, as well as a whole different building type right next to each other. And I do agree that um, something interspersed here and there that's different does create um, a variety and interest in a, um, a subdivision. But if we're looking at uh, an abrupt change from one house to the next, and then all of a sudden, one side of the street is completely different than the other. I'm not sure that that is addressing um, what my concern is of, for the cohesiveness. So I just am really not comfortable with the design guidelines or Appendix A of the um, uh, specific plan. So that's still where I stand. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been trying to kind of group our comments here. I think that the um, specific plan and its, its implementation by phase, maybe one category. Um, I think we've been, I think with a, um, we mentioned again the park happening earlier. I think that comment is registered. And if it's all right with commissioners, I'm going to take that off as having been <clears throat> dealt with or it will be dealt with. Um, the fire police not cost neutral and is, is the, uh, type, uh, of housing reflective of what our community can afford. I kind of, I'm one, I'm thinking those might be one category for us to address. Um, and actually, well, I think the, is, is 911 houses appropriate probably is in a, a plate of, uh, uh, uh place by itself. I think uh, the gateway specifically and the development there may have been addressed. <clears throat> I think I think it has, but I'll leave that to my commissioners in the I'm one vote with uh, Mr. Frase's suggestion of having one cohesive development plan for the whole Creston corridor. I think that makes good sense. Um, so I would 
ask if that seems acceptable that we could move on from that with to the to the commission. So that gives us um, and then I, I don't know that I mentioned this. I apologize if I didn't the road construction phasing simultaneous construction projects going on in the city and um, is, is the timing of it really appropriate to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. <clears throat> so there's specific plan and implementation, road construction, uh, fire, police, cost neutral and affordable housing combined into one um, is the, the density of 911 units appropriate. Are, is there just any of the commissioners to speak up? Is there anything that I'm missing here? Okay. That that summed it up for me. I think you did a great job in uh, in summing it up. Okay, so that's one, two, three. That's four sort of categories. Assuming that we let the gateway issue specifically uh, go to the suggested solution, so that gives us four things to talk about. So I think <clears throat> perhaps next, um, maybe we should maybe we could talk about the road construction, the timing. Simultaneous construction, is it is it soon enough um, for the impact that will be made? Um, Mr. Abbey, would, is that you? Would you like to talk about that? So real quick, before we go to the city engineer on that, just a little context on the road improvements. Um, just remember, this is an EIR. Um, we've spent years on the traffic analysis as well as the financial model for this. Um, it's been carefully combined with the Olson specific plan, traffic study, and their financial model. So this is a very complex um, set of assumptions um, that have been assembled into this proposal. So there's literally years of work that's been put into this. There's also a number of legal um, ramifications in terms of when you can require certain things. You have to meet nexus studies. So we're comfortable that the proposal for the timing and the nature of the traffic improvements um, are all adequate and, and meet those tests. Um, so I just want the commission to be aware of that before we start just um, making wholesale changes to some of these pieces. I think in terms of the impact of road construction on traffic and the community, I think you know that is something we always consider with development projects. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the city engineer. Yes, I'm sorry, I had uh, technical difficulties. Would you repeat the question, please? Well, the question, did you hear Mr. Frace's comments? So Dave, I think the nature of the question is the ability to change the timing of some of the offsite road improvements. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so the EIR sets the uh, timing of the offsite improvements, and um, those improvements are required to mitigate impacts uh, from the project. So they're chosen uh, carefully to um, not impact the you know let the it lets the project build you know build some houses build up some money but it also mitigates the impacts into the future considering other projects uh, in the vicinity of the site so uh in terms of what's there if the if the timing is modified i believe we would have to recirculate the eir at this point um if those dates were pushed out uh, if accelerated, you could require it uh, earlier than what is shown in the EIR. Uh, but at this point, uh, we're fairly confident that the mitigation timing is um, is is reasonable based on the size of the project, the length of the project, and the years until build out for this project. Uh, and some of the pro and some of the mitigations are actually also required up front. Um, they are mitigating their specific impact on the uh, 13th Street corridor um, from River Road to Paso Robles, uh, excuse me, to Riverside Avenue um, in those intersections. So there are uh, quite a, there is a, quite a bit of work that will 
occur up front and um, it's stretched out. It, the timing is stretched out for the rest of the improvements based on when um, we believe that the uh, improvements will be needed. Dave, thank you, David. Um, does does the EIR look at, and I don't think it does, but tell me if I'm right, it doesn't um, comment or consider simultaneous construction going on at once, does it? Would that be purely a city and project man city planning and uh, city comma planning comma and project management decision, not an EIR decision? Yeah, so it's... Um it's always complicated because you have multiple projects around town, including city city projects, where you know the the timing of those projects can depend on a lot of different factors. How many how many how many um, units that each project is building, where they are in their project, um, you have the economy, uh, all these different factors. So there could be there could be a time when um, both projects have to do a um, uh, you know some type of mitigation at the same time. We would work with both of those projects very closely to ensure that um, you know they minimize their short-term impacts, the construction impacts, to the extent possible. Uh, we do that now around town. We have both public works and uh, private development projects that occur, uh, and sometimes they overlap. And it's uh, it's a short term impact, and we realize it uh, it can you know it, it impacts someone's daily life, um, but they are short term, and we try to get those done as soon as possible. Um, All right, thank you. Um Commissioner Gibson, I think this was mostly your comment, not that others might not have agreed. Did you have any, I'll let you go first. Do you have any follow-up questions for Mr. Athey? Uh, I, I don't really have a, a a question. I just, my other than maybe just confirmation that the, the EIR discusses that it's appropriate to take into uh, account the cumulative impact of different projects and, um, and, and I'm, I'm not interested myself in in pushing or delaying things as uh, as uh, Warren was suggesting we shouldn't be doing. I'm actually looking at starting some earlier so they aren't done all the all at the same time. So, uh, but I'm I'm viewing this as from a cumulative impact and trying to keep things in the context that it's. Yes, it just it, we are discussing this project, but we're also discussing a project that you know, was approved uh, earlier uh, to the north and that there are other projects around town that, we, you know, they're on the horizon potentially that that uh, I'm significantly concerned about um, trying to address some of the mitigation earlier than the 554th building permit. So that's my comment. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Were there any, and I'll just let, the other commissioners jump in. Do you have any comments or, or uh, questions on the road issue issues? You know, okay. I'll talk yeah, in for just a Thank moment. You, um, you know, my comment isn't specific to the timing of the road improvements, but I, I just I think it is relevant to that and maybe density as well. Uh, this is where I'm. I'm struggling as a commissioner. I um, I know we've had um, two public comments at our last public hearing, and we've had none tonight. And I think COVID is um, taking its toll. We had ample community input, I think, during the EIR review process, and I we read those letters. There were a lot of comments regarding uh, traffic in there and um, density. And I'm just, you know, I, it's with a heavy heart that, you know, I'm not hearing from them tonight. I think they might be intimidated by this format. And uh, I just think that uh, what people in the community have been concerned about. And so um, that pertains to, I think, the city, I think, uh, public 
safety and traffic. All right, thank you. Okay, shall we, Commissioner, shall we transition on to our next group of four, which was fire police service, um, if the project is construction neutral or not, and should it be, and what does that mean really? <clears throat> and does it have the an adequate housing type that is in reality affordable to our citizens and our community? So, um, Mr. Price, how should we, how do you think we should go about discussing these issues? Who who could help us out here? Well, I think um, it would probably be good to articulate exactly what the question is or concern um, regarding the the financial impacts, police and fire impact issue. That's obviously um, kind of a finance um, issue. So we have CUDA and we have the city manager that are probably best able to address those. Um, those end up being mainly in the development agreement um, is where those are reflected. Yes, and maybe that could could go, if, if it's appropriate, could go sort of hand in hand with the cost neutrality question. I think, yeah, they're the same issue. As you increase one cost, um, you know, it, it comes out somewhere else in the project. Okay, thank you. So who's going to help us out with this? So is there this a, spe is the, a specific yeah, I, question I, I, you're, you're looking for them to answer? You just is it the police and fire this, impact? The, it 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 well, there's a, I've grouped three things together here. Maybe they don't go. First of all, is the cost is the project cost neutral? It sounded like I think I heard two commissioners say they thought it was, but then it was stated it was not, and they were surprised and concerned. Could could you explain that to us? So, Kudi, you want to answer that? Uh, absolutely, Warren. Um, the project is cost neutral for uh, the market rate units. So each market rate unit is paying its fair share based off of our fiscal impact analysis. Uh, we looked at uh, the revenues generated um, on a, uh, for the project as a whole, the costs, uh, the, the services costs attributable to the project. And we came up with a dollar amount that represented each unit's uh, fair share mitigation to result in uh, fiscal neutrality. So uh, the uh, difference is for the 100 units that are affordable uh, or at least uh, not market rate units, uh, the uh, city is obviously considering looking at those units, uh, keeping those units as affordable as possible. And so imposing this additional charge on those units um, that would affect their affordability and therefore they were excluded from, uh, you know, the calculation of fiscal neutrality. So from a per unit basis for the market units, uh, those units do result in uh, fiscal neutrality as, as that is the city objective. Um, I, I think there was um, a comment related to perhaps, uh, you know, reanalyzing the uh, impact and imposing those on the just the market units so that the fiscal neutrality is maintain, uh, maintained for the project as a whole. Um, it, the analysis we looked at was, again, analyzing the fair share component on a per unit basis. So the idea was for any new unit uh, market rate unit that's coming into the city, uh, can we achieve fiscal neutrality on those? And th that's the objective we reached. So to, to answer your, your question specifically, uh, it, the project as a whole, uh, simply because of the affordable units and the uh, approach we're uh, taking to maintain affordability of those units, the project as a whole is not uh, achieving fiscal neutrality from that standpoint, but the objective uh, really is to achieve fiscal neutrality 
for on a per unit basis for all the market rate units um, that would be able to bear the burden of an additional services tax. Um, so, Kuda, this so is I hope Tom. That answers your question. Kuda, this is Tom. I think what I'm hearing from the commission is, are there legal ways, for example, to distribute the um, community financing district costs for those affordable units to the other units? Is that legal or is there some other mechanism that can ensure the overall development does not in any way take resources from the rest of the community, um, but allows the affordable units to remain affordable? So in, in terms of uh, reallocating, uh, it, it is possible. Uh, it does add a layer of uh, complexity in that uh, certain components uh, of the costs, uh, for instance, the infrastructure maintenance component, uh, where you're looking at project infrastructure, the, the roads within the project, the landscaping, et cetera, all of that uh, is part of the project as a whole. And so uh, regardless of how many units are within the entire project, uh, you know, those costs would be incurred uh, and, and so need to be paid. So those are uh, definitely, it's definitely possible to allocate those costs uh, to just the, you know, the specific units. For general services costs, uh, the idea is we're uh, assigning a, f a fair share to each of the units. Again, we're analyzing the project as a whole, obviously, in terms of its overall impact. But uh, from a CFD justification standpoint, um, although the, the uh, Melarus Act does allow flexibility, uh, it does uh, pose the question of equitability uh, in terms of units paying their fair share of, uh, of that services cost. So uh, I would discourage uh, that approach on a services CFD, um, you know, and, and it can certainly be looked at from a legal standpoint and determined, but generally when you determine an impact for a particular project and you're assigning it to units, uh, you do want to maintain that equitable allocation of those services costs. So each unit is paying its mitigation of uh, the, the, the impact it's causing to the city. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mr. Frey, so more kind of a general question. Um, issues like this in the development agreement are probably on the periphery of the planning commission's um, purview and would there is there a way that um, <clears throat> if the planning commission forwarded the recommendation for this project with conditions um, or with changes whatever the end result might be to the city council could we express concern about things <clears throat> that aren't that are again probably on the periphery of our authority to to uh, change or to recommend change too, like issues like looking for ways to um, come closer to cost neutrality, um, looking for ways, um, concerns, just expressing concern to the city council that we hope that they will address and consider the fire and police protection for the entire city and that not that, that nothing else will be compromised. Would that, is that an approach that we could take? Yeah, I think that's ideally how it, that would move forward. So resolution G would be a recommendation on the development agreement. Obviously, this is a legal agreement that the attorneys have been drafting for quite some time. So it's not appropriate to try to rewrite it at this point. But if you wanted to afford it with some general concerns or questions that you wanted the council to consider before they adopted it, um, like the revenue neutrality sort of issue, I think that would be appropriate. Madam, Madam Chairwoman, may I speak? Yes, is this Commissioner Gibson? Yes, thank you, yes, uh, Commissioner Gibson. So I guess I would put it like this way, because I, I took a little exception to the idea that you know that we're trying to be negative or whatever. I think we're trying to figure out how to make this project work. You know, and I I look at this and say, you know, this the city is the city just like every city kind of struggles sometimes on finances but in context in a very short period of time we're going to go try to convince the public to raise the taxes on themselves 
how do we do that at the same time we're approving projects that cost them money and are not revenue neutral? I think that's a, you know, contradiction of a position. So um, I'm fully supportive of housing and we need housing, but how do you go to the existing citizens and say that the new housing is not going to pay for itself? And so at the same time, we need emergency services because we're short and we need you to raise your taxes. So I just think that's a difficult proposition. So thank you. All right. Um, the other item that I had in this group of concerns, maybe I'm not sure it belongs here. Um, it actually might work better with um, <clears throat> is 911 the appropriate number. Um, is is the type of housing and its ability to be afforded by our community, and particularly overall as well as in the earliest earlier phases of the project, and that maybe Mr. Frey, you could talk about that and how that, and I, I know you've addressed before how that works back to the housing element, but maybe remind us and put it in context. <laughs> So yeah, we kind of end up with this balancing act. Obviously, the more costs we put on to the market rate housing, the less affordable it becomes. So the project is designed, the majority of it is single family. As Lisa was talking about though, there's a lot of options for smaller um, units, duplexes, triplexes to be mixed into the single family areas. Um, but as you try to accelerate the park or accelerate traffic improvements or increase the um, CFD um, taxes on these units, they'll become less and less affordable. Right now, between the CFD taxes, the homeowners association maintenance fees, these projects are are fairly difficult to make work financially. Um, so that's kind of the house of cards that everybody's dealing with as we move forward. So to deal with that, that's one of the reasons we've added the ADU provision because the ADU is a rental product. It could be affordable to service workers. It could also be a benefit to a property owner that's trying to make a mortgage on a single family house. So that seems like one of those kind of logical solutions that it really could get to the core of the problem where we're dealing with the affordability for the single family owner, but also trying to deal with the service worker at the same time. There's also these medium density area project areas um, that can go up to about, I think, uh, what is it, 14 units to the acre. Um, so the development agreement um, requires that a portion of those, I believe around 90, be sold at the workforce rate. So that's a above the moderate rate, but, low, but below market rate. Um, so that's another solution. And then finally, we have the apartment complexes that are required to be affordable. There's different options that a certain portion of those apartments then have to be deed restricted to low income. So I think it's a combination between all of these that is intended to address that full range of different housing needs that we have in the community. All right, thank you. At any uh, commissioners have any questions? Oh, Mr. Frace, could you add on to that the 911 versus the six, is it 624, 674? So the base density is 674. So if you took out 237 units, those are going to come out of the higher density product. You'll just end up with more single family and less multifamily. And why is that? Because that's the base zoning. This whole project is zoned single family. What, there are, what the specific plan adds is actually the variety of housing type. If we go back and look at uh, the general plan for the site, which is, uh, we don't have the existing map, um, but the existing general plan, the whole site is designated single family today. All right, thank you. Okay, other commissioners in the uh, in that group of the 674 to the 911, um, the housing types, any comments or questions? Uh, 
Um, just a couple, Madam Chair, it's Commissioner Kogler. Commissioner Kogler, go ahead. Um, changing the number by saying it's 50 too high or 100 too high or whatever it might be um, is kind of arbitrary and abstract to me because I don't think those kind of numerical changes in unit counts make that much difference overall in traffic and maybe even some of the financial implications of this. Um, I, I do perceive that the plan as proposed, since it does dial in uh, areas of multifamily housing and areas potentially of mixed use, is a plus. I'm not sure that just because it has single family zoning on it right now that allows 674 units that somebody could come in with a 674 unit project that would be something beyond just single family. I mean, they could come up with another plan that still included some multifamily, but this one is in front of us and it does that. And I think that's a benefit to the community. Um, we, we talked in general a few minutes ago about housing being built to a price point, and this is my interpretation, a price point that people in the community could afford. And I guess I would argue that has to happen in the marketplace or this whole thing will fail. Uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the housing product that's going in here has to be something that the market can accept. And that's obviously the product of the, the physical housing itself, as well as some of the underlying financial implications of the, 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 the money that each unit is paying to support the development as a whole. So that's complex. And I guess I'm still, I'll come back to I'm still comfortable with, with the 911. Um, I do think there's value in the unit types that are represented here that are beyond the single family, and I do think they would benefit the community as a whole. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I think at this point, let me, let me give you what I've heard on the on our forecast. And since we can't see each other, let me repeat again kind of the general four categories that we have. Uh, the first is specific plan, um, continuity, potentially master development plan, those type of issues. Number two is um, traffic road construction issues. Number three, um, cost revenue neutrality, fire police uh, services. <clears throat> and number four is the um, number of units and the housing type. So of those four, I'm wondering if we can check off a couple here that we might have heard enough to be satisfied or might have heard enough that we could make a recommendation to the city council if we provided additional comments um, in addition to our motion that would be concerns that we would ask them to consider before they approve. So I wish we could do a raise of hands here, um, but maybe we'll just do a straw vote on each of those. The first one, and this one probably has the most vague wording, but the first one is the specific plan, architectural standards and guidelines, uh, overall development, transition, continuity, those things. Um, Let's just go go through and say generally, are you comfortable with that? Could we move on even if we um, made some? Well, let's just say, are you comfortable with that? Or would we need to continue to discuss and to come up with some um, options in our in our motion? So, um, Commissioner Coburn. Um, the, I guess, of the four that you just <clears throat> ran through, this one's probably the most challenging for me to understand and to try to project what we could offer as additional advisories to the council as they continue to, to move this forward. Because I certainly to a degree share, but I've heard other commissioners perhaps tonight state more emphatically that the some of the design standards are, or the design standards as a whole perhaps are not to the degree that they need to be in order to adequately convey the quality of development or the form of development that's being articulated here. And okay, so I'm sorry, go ahead. And that's very difficult to, I think, to, and it's not our role necessarily to, to put that into words and to make that happen. Um, I am comfortable with the overall specific plan itself. 
in terms of the mix of units, the lot layout, the street pattern, um, the park, and some of those kinds of things. Uh, so that's easy for me to say yes to. Um, how we would provide additional guidance on any of the standards or guidelines themselves is a bit of a question mark for me. Thank you. So is that you could go ahead and vote now or you think it needs more work? Well, I, I think more work as in um, for the commission to come up with either language or recommendations. Yeah, I don't know. Again, as I said, I don't know what that form would be because I don't think this. Well, commission that's OK, but we're just yeah, trying to find that. out now if there's anything we can move on and say, OK, we're, we can we don't need to talk about any of these anymore. So my question is, do we need to keep talking about that or are you satisfied? You can put me in the satisfied category for the moment. OK. All right. That's fair enough. OK. Um, Commissioner Davis. Um, because I don't have any specific design recommendations um, to make it better, um, I will say I'm satisfied at the moment. Okay. Commissioner Neal. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure that satisfied or not satisfied really addresses this issue. Um, I am not supportive of the architectural guidelines or standards as written. And I agree with Commissioner Kogler that it is not our place to adjust those. So um, I, I'm not sure where I am. I, I, I don't think we can answer that question this evening. So that is my position. All right. So you're not ready to move on on this one. Um, well, I guess I'm not at sure. At this time comment um, will answer it either, or comment or discussion. Okay. All right, Commissioner Gibson. I uh, tend to um, follow the uh, words of uh, Commissioner Neal uh, in regards to uh, this area. Um, and at the same time, um, I agree with Commissioner Kogler in terms of the overall uh, scoping of the project, um, you know, how it's laid out, the park, the roads, um, the macro parts of this. Um, I really don't have uh, any uh, significant concerns, uh, but I don't know how to solve or resolve the, uh, the question of the uh, more the micro sort of uh, details and the transitioning and of the neighborhoods etc I, I would i would you know I, i'm i would not want to see um in essence kind of a balkanization of uh of the community um of, you know re regardless of, of where it is and um i don't know that that's this commission's responsibility to do that it would seem like that's more the responsibility of the applicant so thank you okay thank you um and Commissioner Davis, I got you, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I too think it's, I would agree with that. The, mac, the I think that's a good way to put it. The macro <clears throat> view is okay. I don't think it's ready to go yet on implementation. Okay, let's move on to the second one. Road construction which really ties back to traffic and the EIR. Um, let's go through again. Are we, and my question is, would you be, are you, are you ready to consider a motion? Co uh, Commissioner Coba. Um, Madam Chair, as far as traffic goes, there's, there's nothing that would impede me being able to either make or participate in a motion this evening. Great, okay, Commissioner uh, Davis. I'm concerned about traffic um, and um, I, I tend to correlate it with um, density and wonder if if there was a reduction in the density if there would be some improvement in that it's something that's I'm trying to figure out in my mind so um, I I'm not ready to vote on traffic okay okay Commissioner Neal. 
I am completely comfortable with the EIR. Okay, Commissioner Gibson. Um, I, 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 I am completely uncomfortable with the EIR. So um, it would depend, obviously, then on how the motion was made. Um, I just think we have to be smarter than what's being proposed. Um, and I and I view that what we do in our recommendation and and the city and then to the city council is we're trying to make the project better. And um, I just think there's better ways of doing it than waiting till all these houses get built and then we tear all the roads up. So I that, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you. And I could vote in favor of the EIR. Okay, um, this next one really is, the question is more um, not related to a motion, but would you be generally comfortable um, with the development agreement? I guess it is kind of related to a motion. Generally, and I'm not asking for a vote here, just generally comfortable with the development agreement if the commission um, send it along with some concerns, including but not limited to revenue neutrality, police and fire services adequacy. Commissioner Kogler. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Davis. Yes, I would. All right, Commissioner Neal. Yeah, hey, I would not, as the um, specific plan is an integral part of the development agreement, and I believe is one of the appendices, so. And Commissioner Gibson. I, I again, I, I agree with Commissioner Neal. I mean, um, with the caveat that it was cost neutral, um, I, I, I would, be greatly more persuaded to um, adopt this, but I think there's other issues that um, the commission is not in agreement on. So I don't, it, you know, the development agreement kind of packages everything up in all, in all the previous uh, documents and it's kind of like the cherry on top. So I don't know how you do that without having an agreement on all the underlying okay. documents and amendments. So thank you. Okay, and I will I will say yes because I'm not taking this as a literal <clears throat> literal literal vote. I'm taking it that I would be willing to add some uh, parallel concerns to the city council, even if we were, um, and then be able to vote on the rest of the of the development agreement. Okay, so the last our last one is the density, the 911 versus 674. Um, we had mixed in there the question of housing that's affordable to practical and from a practical sense to our community. Um, so really this is, do you feel like this discussion needs to be continued on 911 versus 674? I think that's what this boils down to. So Commissioner Coglin. Uh, I personally am satisfied and have enough background on the density that I could, could vote on that. All right, thank you. Commissioner Davis? I wouldn't be ready to vote just yet on that density. Okay, uh, Commissioner Neal? I could vote on density. All right, Commissioner Gibson? I, I could probably vote on it. Um, I'm looking, uh, what Warren said resonated with me that the additional density gives us uh, some more affordable housing, more dense housing that doesn't exist now, and um, the option of switching to or leaving it at 674 um, housing units. We don't have a project before us that does that, and um, so I, I would be ready to move forward. All right, um, as would I. Okay, so well, these are our you know, some of these votes of, that from all of us are a little vague. I think we are split on everything. <laughs> the uh, specific plan, a specific and mo most concerned with the detail of it and the implementation, we're about half and half. Um, the road construction, we're about three and two. Uh, um, 
the development plan with you no know, approving it with notes, I think was was more were in favor, but my hearing on, on those who were not was because of other concerns such as the specific plan and other issues. So I, I'm taking that, that the idea, if those other issues were, most of them were resolved, we could send it with some additional notes to the city council eventually, but not yet. And lastly, the 911, um, I think there was one dissenting vote, but the others were in agreement. So we may be the closest on that one. So as far as where we go from here, um, I think there, I have a couple of thoughts. One is that I'm not sure that it's fair to the other applicants on tonight's agenda, because I think this is going to take a while. And I would ask um, staff if there is something we could do to um, not hold them up and to um, yet allow us to continue our discussion. And what we might do at that point is to start to go through the motions, um, the, I believe it's seven, and just see where we can get. So, Mr. Fries? So, you know, with regards to your other items, um, it is right now 940. Um, so you have the option, I guess you could just decide that you're not going to get to those items tonight and continue those dates certain to August 25th. And then you can just focus on um, your recommendation on Beachwood. So that's one option. Um, your other option is to see where you're at when you get done with Beachwood and see if you have time to hear any of the additional items. But I think those are your two choices. All right, uh, do you have a recommendation for us? Unfortunately, we can't see the applicants. We don't have any context for this conversation. So do you have a recommendation? I think we're gonna to defer to the commission and we're not sure exactly how long it's gonna to take to, to get through these Beachwood okay. items. All right. Um, okay, let's go around. Mr. Kogler, do you think we should um, defer the other items to date certain next meeting? Yes or no? Let's just do yes or no. <laughs> it's always hard sometimes to do a yes or no. I, I, that's what's what we lack, need. I realize what's <laughs> lacking for me is is some sense of the urgency of moving those those on and the fairness to the people involved. Um, I would, I'm not sure there's a lot of difference in the, the two options that Mr. Frace just, just offered other than the the other applicants can tune out right now, but okay. If they're let's willing to hang, going. if they're willing to hang right. in there, let's I'm willing to going. hang in there. All right, yeah. all right. Let's just keep going. Well, we're going yeah. to hang in here on Beachwood, so all right. Howard, Madam Chair, I, we'll just let it go. Madam Chair, do we know if they're cute? Yep. I don't. What's the question? Are the other items queued up? Are they waiting? Yes. Well, I think they've heard that we've got a lot more to go. So let's just keep going. All right. My my suggestion next is that if we look at um, page three of our agenda, they are the, the seven uh, resolutions that we would need to vote on to send, make a recommendation to the city council. So let's just take these one by one and talk through them. So the first one is certification of the final project environmental impact report. And I believe the most specific thing of our four issues that we just went through related to that would be the road construction, um, the traffic, and as Mr. Frey indicated, um, moving, moving project work forward would not affect the EIR, it would affect project and funding and so on, but it would not necessarily affect the EIR, delaying it would. So is do I have a motion for certification of the final project environmental impact report? Madam Chair, if I could, this is Joel, I think the EIR also addresses the density or the number of units, not the density, but the number of units. Um, so I think if there's a discussion on the 674 to the 911, we would need mm -hmm. to accept the reduced alternative in the EIR and as a 
as a mm -hmm. recommend to the council. I believe Mr. Price can um, correct me if I'm wrong. So the EIR covers the proposed project at 911. It also includes an alternative project at 674. So you can certify the EIR and then theoretically adopt either project underneath it. I guess all right. Wrong. So that so <laughs> all right. Okay. I, so I will, make, I will make a motion, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. I will second Approved. that, Madam Chair. Well, let's Sorry, already Joe. make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I move. I'm trying to move it on too, so that's a good thing. So go ahead. <laughs> I move okay. approval of resolution A, recommending City Council certify the environmental impact report, adopt environmental findings a mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of overriding considerations pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. How about now second on a second? By Commissioner Kogler. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so discussion. Commissioner Kogler or commission. Let's do Commissioner Neal. You made the motion and into discussion. No, nope, I'm ready to vote. All right, Mr. Kogler. No further discussion. Um, Commissioner Davis. Um, yeah, real quickly, I I think that Commissioner Gibson has um, and Warren Frace have convinced me that the additional density is important to the community, and so I'll be supporting the 911. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, Commissioner Gibson, comments? So I guess I, I, that was a comment or a question. So, um, you know, I, I've expressed the idea that, you know, I'm not comfortable with the um, suggestion that we wait until so late in the projects to start doing road mitigation by approving this intact the way this is. Is that pretty much set that in stone? Mr. Frace. So the traffic timing is in the mitigation monitoring program. All the uh, traffic improvements are timed in terms of when they're required to mitigate the impact of the project, which is the legal nexus standard for when you can require them. So staff doesn't believe the commission actually has the authority to require any of them to happen earlier um, because you can't meet the nexus findings for making them happen. All right, thank you. All right, then I will call the question. May we have a vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. No. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes four to one. Okay. Progress. Um, the next is general plan amendments to the land use element, housing element, and parks and recreation element. Um, Madam Chair, do I have a solution or a motion? You like what? <laughs> yes, like motion, yes. A motion. Yes, thank you. I'd like to move to approve resolution B, recommending approval of general plan amendment 12-004 plus addendum 1G and 1H. All right, motion by Neil is our second. And I believe Commissioner Neil, there was an addendum to this. I believe I added that addendum 1G and 1H. Oh, I beg your pardon. G and H. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Ms. Commissioner, Commissioner Gibson. Gibson. All right. All right. Discussion. Commissioner Neal. I have none. Commissioner Gibson. I have no comments. Commissioner Kogler. No further discussion. Commissioner Davis. None. Thank you. All right. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. 
Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. All right, zone change. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Neal, you want to keep a run? I will on this one. Um, <laughs> approve res resolution C, recommending approval of zoning code amendment 19-01. I'll second Motion that, by Neil, second by Coger. All right, discussion, Commissioner Neal. I have none. Commissioner Coger. Uh, none. Commissioner Davis. None. Commissioner Gibson. I have none. All right, may we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Coger. Aye. Commissioner Davis? Aye. Commissioner Gibson? Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen? Aye. Passes 5-0. All right, good. All right, the next is the specific plan and addendums one and two. Do I have a motion? All right, hearing none. Um, Mr. Frace, are we able to vote on E and F? No, E and F D? are dependent on D. Um, you actually right. need to make a comprehensive recommendation to the city council. So you need to make a recommendation on D. Okay, that's what I thought. I wanted to make sure. Okay, so we need to talk about this some more, it sounds like. Um, I'll start in that I have been saying all along that I just, I, I can't understand why there isn't some kind of a master development plan, not to the detail that we've seen before. That, I've never said that, um, was quoted as that, but didn't ever said that. Um, but with be a conceptual guiding um, development plan that the other specific development plans would then fit into. Um, without doing that, I would say that this, the architectural guidelines and the architectural standards um, and some other areas of the specific plan are not ready to go. They're given that, that this is going to be a number <clears throat> of pieces of Legos stuck together uh, without knowing what what the end creature is that we're trying to make. Um, I could not support the specific plan as it is. I believe that it can be made workable, um, but I don't think it's there. So those are my comments. Commissioner Kogler. I don't disagree with your comments, Madam Chair. I would like to see particularly the design standards, um, for lack of a better term, beefed up a bit. Um, and I, I don't think there's any way that, that we can simply probably forward this to the council with suggestions as to how that could occur, because as I indicated before, that's not really our bailiwick. So I'm in a bit of a quandary for this. I, I do support most of the specific plan. Um, I think it's just a few of those pieces that are rather critical that are hangups right now for me as well. All right, thank you. Commissioner Davis. I have nothing. Commissioner Neal. I agree entirely with the uh, um, first two speakers. All right, and Commissioner Gibson. 
I, I'm in agreement with the comments. I, I, the only thing I would really add is that, uh, as I said, the, the macro is not the issue, it's the micro. Um, but I do appreciate uh, Warren's suggestion for having a single development plan along Creston Road. That seemed to make a, a lot of sense to me. Thanks. All right, thank you for adding that comment. I think that's an important one as well. Well, Mr. Frace, where do we go from here? Because this is obviously not something we can advise on rewrite. Probably, certainly not tonight, probably not ever. So where do we go from here? Well, the concern is this, these are the same issues that were raised at the last meeting. Uh, we thought, based on the direction from the last meeting, we had addressed them. Um, obviously, we fell short there. Um, the concern is we don't really have clear direction on exactly what it is we would fix. Um, I guess in terms of the development plan issue, I, there's been a lot of discussion about the lack of detail and the need for development plans. And you know, just to circle back on this issue, that is part of the specific plan is that there is this secondary level of review where development plans for each of the subphases are going to be submitted. They will go through the Development Review Committee and the Planning Commission for approval. So I believe that most of the issues in terms of how one track matches with the other, what the mix of units are, how the interpretation of the guidelines, those are all issues that both the DRC and the Planning Commission are set up to review in the future. It's not as detailed as it is with the Olson project, but like we mentioned, the Olson project is actually an outlier, um, and there's some drawbacks with being that specific when you know these projects take 20 years to build out. So I really think the commission needs to articulate what's missing in this development process, development plan process. I think we could add a specific requirement for a, a larger development plan along Creston Road. If you want to add maybe a, the same requirement for phases um, 1A and 1B so that you could see how those would be better um, organized. So, you know, here's your 1A, here's 1B, here's phase two, um, if you wanted maybe to add a requirement that there would be a larger phase, so rather than just seeing A by itself and B by itself, maybe if you wanted to see, you know, A, B, G, and H all as one piece, or D, E, and F as one piece, or this area down as two, you know, we could add that as kind of an intermediate layer, um, and maybe that addresses the issue. Commissioners, what do you think? Commissioner Kogler? Uh, actually, Mr. Frist, I like that thought because it maybe is a, a good hybrid approach here to be able to see a larger landmass in terms of development. I don't know if it's A, B, G, and H or C2 is included and keep out C1 or what the combination is, but I like that thought. And I think that potentially could move us along tonight, or at least could move me along tonight. Thanks for okay, putting that thank forward. You. Commissioner Neal, what do you think? Um, I'm still not ready to move it forward. Uh, so I just think there needs to be more specificity. I think it puts too much onus on the DRC and the Planning Commission in the future to try to um, figure out. And the way these, I believe, the way these design guidelines and um, design standards are written is that um, essentially anything, almost anything, can go on these lots. Commissioner Davis. Um, I really like the idea of this, uh, the single development plan along the Creston corridor. That's really important to me. I'd like to see that. Um, I'm uncertain about the latter. Um, I, I'm on the fence on that, but I would like to see the, um, the development plan for the Creston Road corridor. All right, thank you, Commissioner Gibson. Um, I am also on the fence on that. I like I like the staff suggestion uh, because I think it would uh, get us a long ways towards more continuity and uh, 
things working together, dovetailing together. Um, I, again, I, I don't think it's commission's uh, role to be coming up with these specifics. And um, I agree that the specifics are lacking. So, um, but I, I, whereas I like the suggestion, I think that's a step in the right direction. I don't know that that actually answers everything. All right, thank you. I, I too think it's a good idea. I like it. It's definitely a, an important step. As long as they're large enough um, grouping areas, I'm thinking the colors as they're shown on this, pink and gray and green, except for the um, crest and quarter. But having said that, um, that's part of it. I, I think we were pretty clear last time when we said that four or five or six um, bullets to describe, for example, what a um, ranch, modern ranch house or whatever they're called, farmhouse, is, you know, it, it's just not, and some photographs is, is not going to cut it. So, and then I, I'm concerned that there were a number of variety of houses that were then taken down to three. Um, so, you know, I think, we are not trying to make this monotonous. We are trying to give this some um, additional guidance. Here's, you know, here's the example. Mediterranean, there's one paragraph and four bullets and four houses or four photographs. And there's nothing wrong with any of those. They're all fine. But it's just we're going to start all over again. Every time one of these smaller You're development plans comes in, it, we're just going to start over. And... Um, with discussions Please like this, so I'm concerned. To to the meeting. Thank you for your patience. You are now joining the meeting. Is, is am I hearing strange? Yeah, I I am as well. Okay, can we do a sound check? Is everybody got audio now? You sound good, Warren. I was someone was entering the meeting, and then there was a echo chamber. Okay, so Roberta, you're okay. Field, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mark. Yes, it's all back. Davis. It's better. Okay. How about you, Joel? I'm good. Okay. So, uh, anyway. Madam Chair, on the architectural guideline issue, um, I think the biggest change was we had a section on craftsmen. Craftsmen isn't included right now. You could add craftsmen back in. I think we had um, Spanish, Mediterranean, and Monterey as three separate kind of categories. And I think their thinking was they wanted to combine those together um, into a single Mediterranean um, group. Um, obviously, you can always add more details and more uh, kind of guidelines to these sections. Um, and I think if you wanted to push this along to city council and ask that we add a, that additional layer, we obviously have the uptown specific plan that basically um, incorporates the exact same types. We could probably um, borrow some parts from the uptown plan and maybe roll those in as kind of a supplemental layer as it goes on to council. All right, that's a good option. Um, if Could you go back, Warren, to the, the site plan with the areas? Yes. That you just had on a moment ago. All right, so my thought is if we if we did um, four areas, so roughly these, I don't care if those are the exact boundaries, although Ridge Road would seem like certainly seem like a logical break, but roughly this in an addition, the Creston Road corridor. And we um, <clears throat> asked we we said to the city council that um, additional to soup that our recommendation assumes that there will be um, additional detail provided by staff um, understaffed um, 
oversight, how that wording would be for the architectural guidelines and standards, I could, I'm thinking I could go maybe with that. That's not a final yes, but that's a leaning yes. So with that thought, can we go around one more time? Commissioner Kogel? I would lean in your direction, same thing. Just, uh, Commissioner Davis? Um, ditto. Commissioner Neal? Uh, yes, I could lean in that direction, but I think I would like to see the, the plan for uh, north of Ridge Road and south of Ridge Road, uh, mostly because I believe C2 and D, um, there are lots right across the street from each other in that particular uh, setup. So if we could do kind of north of Ridge Road, south of so Ridge how Road. Would, how would you divide? Oh, I see. All of north of Ridge Road, all of south. Of, so essentially phase one and phase two? Yes. Phase one and phase two and the Creston Corridor? Yes. Okay. And then the recommendation to City Council that staff oversee adding additional detail <clears throat> to the architectural standards and guidelines? Yes, I could be supportive of that this evening. All right. And Commissioner Gibson? Yeah, I would uh, be supportive of that. I like the idea of the phase one, phase two, and then uh, and then the Creston Road uh, uh, specific area plan. I, I like that idea. All right. Do I then after that discussion, do I hear a motion? Can I ask for a motion? I will make one if um, Mr. Frace will bring up the uh, <laughs> motions for me. Yeah, let me. Oh, there it is. Okay. It is. So it was a resolution D. I move approval of resolution D recommending adoption of specific plan 19 01, addendum 1I, and addendum 2B and 2C, change definitions appendix D to E, as well as requiring a um, or suggesting a um, overlay plan for phase one and a separate one for phase two, as well as for uh, the Creston Road corridor. I think that's I'll second. It. Thank you. I'll second the motion. All right, Gibson seconds. Um, I have a question. When you say overlay plan, are you saying a development plan? Yes, I'm sorry, you? development plan. Okay, so would the um, motion maker and the seconder accept that change of wording? I, I'll, I'll accept it. Okay. All right. Um, discussion, Mr. Neal? None. Mr. Gibson? I have none. Commissioner Davis? None. Commissioner Coglin? Uh, perhaps it's the hour, but just to clarify, it does include additional work on the design guidelines and standards, integrating perhaps some of what the city has in other areas and some of input from the developer. Is that the case? And that is the case, and thank you so much. I forgot to add that. All right, so does the maker of the second accept that addition? Yes, I do. Thank you for the clarification. I think it is getting late. I didn't catch that either. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Um, may we have a roll call vote? And could you, um, Mr. Frace, would you read back the motion? Yeah. So the motion is resolution D plus addendum 1I and addendums 2B and 2C um, change the <laughs> definition section from appendix D to appendix E, add in the requirement that four additional master development plans um, be provided, including the Creston Corridor and the areas north and south of Ridge Road, um, enhance the appendix A design guidelines um, with additional design standards and incorporate um, details from other uh, city guidelines that are currently adopted. Um, I'm not sure four so three. Should be plans three. was right. It should three. be phase one, phase two, and the Creston Corridor. 
So three? Yes. Correct. Got it. Correct. All right, may we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Neal. Nope, I, excuse me. Who am I missing? Kogler, sorry. Kogler. Aye. Uh, Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. All right, the motion passes 5 0. All right, congratulations, Commissioner. We reached a compromise. Excellent. Good work. All Madam, right. Can I make a resolution? Yes. yes. I'd like to approve resolution E, recommending approval of Oak Tree permit, removal permit OTR 19 05 plus addendum 1J and 1K. Is there a second? I'll second, I'll second that. that. I'm going to give that to Commissioner Davis. All right. Uh, discussion, Commissioner Neal? I have none. Commissioner Davis? None. Commissioner Kogler? None. Commissioner Gibson? I have none. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal? Aye. Commissioner Davis? Aye. Commissioner Gibson? Aye. Commissioner Kogler? Aye. Chairperson Davis, uh, excuse me, Jorgensen? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Proceed. Uh, I'd like to move to approve Resolution F, recommending approval of the vesting tentative track map TR 3160 plus Addendum 1. I believe that is an I or is that an L? L. L. One L. I'll second that. Commissioner Neal, discussion? None. Commissioner Kogler? None. Commissioner Davis, discussion? None. Mr. Gibson. I have done. All right, may we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Madam Chair, I'd like to make the last motion this evening on this item. All right, thank you. I'd like to move approval of Resolution G, recommending approval of development agreement 220-05 between the City of Paso Robles and the Beachwood Owners Group, plus Exhibit F update. Is there a second? I'll second that. Commissioner Kobler. All right. Um, Discussion on this, Commissioner Neal? Uh, just the two items. I think it was 1 72 and 1 or 1.7.2 1 and 1.7.3 needed some word smithing. All right. Um, Co Commissioner Kogler, were you the second? Yes, I was. Do you have any discussion? Um, no, I, I guess my support of this um, still includes the discussions we've had over the course of two meetings now, and I think what staff understands at least the interests of the commission and being the advance of the park and some of the other items in the development agreement, and I trust that staff will carry those messages in total back to the council. Commissioner Davis? I agree with Commissioner Kogler's comments. Thank you for um, stating those. Commissioner Gibson? I uh, also appreciate Commissioner Kogler's uh, comments. I just um, need clarification because I, I still struggle to support the project if it's not going to be cost neutral. So, I mean, is that one of the items that would be carried back to the council? 
perhaps we should should we be may I ask the motion maker and the second or should we be specific and have concerns listed such as revenue neutrality and police and fire services adequacy? So we need to be as specific as possible for the council recommendation. But those would be side recommendations, not part of the motion, correct, Mr. Price? So what it will be is you'll recommend approval with um, basically um, in addition that you desire the city council to consider um, these following issues. And then you could just list what those issues are and kind of generally what your concern or parameters would be for them to consider. But is that part of the motion or is that yes. just... That is part of the motion. Yes. All right. And what we'll do, it won't actually go in the development agreement. It'll go in the uh, wording of the resolution um, that in addition to the recommendations on the exhibits, um, the commission's desire is that the council consider the following items. So, Madam, Madam Chairwoman, I, I would uh, strongly encourage us to do that um, so that it actually is down in writing uh, things such as the cost neutrality and, and uh, the park being done sooner than later. So the, whatever the items are that are of concern to the commission, I would suggest that, that we actually um, have a motion that actually lists those. What does the motion maker think of that? I am comfortable with the cost neutrality regarding the infrastructure. Um, I do not think we need to have cost neutrality regarding the services um, in regards to the um, uh, affordable housing. So I would not be comfortable with that ad. Um, I believe that the EIR laid out the mitigations and the um, requirements for the police and fire. And as um, the project grows, the project will um, add additional funds to police and fire as necessary. So I would not be interested in adding that as part of my motion. So what would you add? Um, I, believe our, I believe the representative from DTA said we could um, relatively easily move the cost of the infrastructure to the remaining 811 homes. Um, but the service portion is a little more nebulous and difficult. So um, and I, I agree that the reason for the affordable housing is uh, we need to uh, have that in our community and it, it, it betters the community. And I think as a taxpayer, I'd be willing to cover that cost on the services um, for that particular. So that's where I'm sitting. Oh, yes to the infrastructure, no to the services portion. And um, I think that also, and no to the requirement that they fund, pre-fund police or fire, I think is what we're kind of getting at. I'm sure question is yes to the park, yeah. Commissioner Neal. Absolutely, yes, to the park. Okay, thank you. So could Commissioner Neal or Mr. Frace read back the resolution or the, the motion? So it's resolution G plus exhibit F, um, clean up those reference items that were discussed with the city attorney. It sounds like we have consensus on accelerating the timing of the park. Um, it's not clear though on revenue neutrality what the recommendation is. Part of my motion is to, um, I, I believe there are two um, special services districts or two. There's one for services and one for infrastructure, if I'm not mistaken. So the, Mr. Price. There's, there's two CFDs. One CFD is the services CFD. Um, that goes back to the city to cover city services, primarily police and fire staffing. There's also an infrastructure bonding CFD that covers infrastructure both on-site and off-site. So those are the two CFDs. But when we're talking about revenue neutrality of the city, we're just talking about services. The infrastructure bonding is basically part of the project and it serves only the project and their um, conditions of approval. 
Okay, I guess I missed and the other one from DTA. So, and Commissioner, and I, the other I, point I, to add to, to Mr. Fraser's comments is that the infrastructure costs are fully borne by the development. There is no cost shifting of infrastructure back to the rest of the city. So that was Matt Summers, the city attorney. And Kuda, did you want to add anything in addition to that? Uh, sure, Warren. And just to clarify my point earlier, um, when I was referring to uh, infrastructure component, I was referring to the infrastructure maintenance component of the services CFD. So in other words, uh, the project has an obligation to maintain certain infrastructure um, and that's included in the CFD. There's also a portion of the services CFD that is related to police, fire, and other general city services. So within the overall services CFD tax, um, there's an infrastructure maintenance component and a general city services component. And my comments earlier were referring to um, allocating uh, e either one of those to the market rate units. And I, I was basically saying that the city services component is harder to allocate uh, to, to push on to the market rate units, infrastructure maintenance, uh, because it's project wide, may be pushed onto onto uh, the 811 units. Uh, so I, I hope that clarifies my my point earlier. It does. Maybe if I could try um, saying that uh, recommend um, revenue neutral or attempt at revenue neutrality. Um, taking in account um, other well, no, I don't know how to I don't know how to word it. So, I mean, Commissioner I, Neal, if I could be so bold, as please to do offer oh. a suggestion. You might make a motion to, with the approvals as noted uh, for Resolution G, with recommendation of the City Council to to achieve cost neutrality to the extent possible while still preserving the affordable housing, and uh, leave the details to. Mr. Ma Mr. Wekwede and the council. I believe, Matt, you've read my mind. You're welcome. All right. So are we ready for a vote? So, so just for clarity, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, so with the brilliant wordsmithing that we just heard, that and yes on the park, correct? Correct. Thank you. And for clarity, I'm, I'm hoping that the city council will perceive um, uh, police and fire as an important service to preserve. So I think the language might include that. Is that correct? Yes, I think we understood that as part of uh, the cost neutrality component to ensure to the maximum extent possible that existing residents do not bear the cost of providing services to the new project. Thank you. I'm comfortable with that. And the seconder is comfortable with all those changes. Excellent. All right. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Chairperson uh, Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. That will complete this item. Thank you, everyone. Staff and commissioners and applicant. Thank you, everyone. Um, if it's all right, unless anyone says they really would like to take a break, I'd like to just power through these last two items. Any objection? Good. All right. Um, agenda item number two. Tentative parcel map PR 20-0036, P20-00C26. Um, and first of all, thank you to the applicants for sticking with us. I'm sorry it's so late, but we got to you. So may we please have staff report. Yeah, we're queuing that up right now. Hang on a second.
You ready, Darren? Okay, Darren Nash. Thank you, Warren. Madam Chair, members of the commission, this is the uh, second item on the agenda tonight. It is a tentative parcel map uh, for some for an existing lot located at 541 28th Street. Uh, Jessica and Kyle Baker are the applicants. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a parcel on the corner of 28th Street and Oak Street. There are three existing residential homes on this lot that have been there for many years. Uh, the request before you tonight is to subdivide this parcel into three parcels uh, where the subdivision would uh, have each home be on a separate parcel. So currently there are three existing single family residences with three detached accessory buildings. Each house has separate sewer water and utilities, as well as parking areas. The current situation is one owner owns all three of the homes. The uh, vicinity map here shows the red outline is the existing parcel. The two yellow lines are the proposed parcel lines with the tentative map that would create three parcels uh, for uh, each of the homes to be on one parcel. The subdivision would generally uh, have uh, three parcels, roughly 5,000 square foot uh, lots that would accommodate these homes. This is a uh, uh, showing the site plan of the tenant the map where we'd have the three parcels, uh, kind of shows the parking, uh, tandem parking for lots two and three, uh, which was the existing situation. And then the parking for parcel one would remain coming off of Oak Street. These are some photographs of the existing homes. Photograph, photograph on the right, uh, or actually let's start with the left. The photograph on the left is parcel one. This is the house on the corner of Oak and 28th. Uh, the photograph on the right is the uh, house at 541 28th Street, proposed parcel two, and then proposed parcel three has a carport. And this is the, uh, uh, the home furthest to the east. This is a uh, photographs of uh, the home on parcel one and the frontage along Oak Street. This is another uh, view. It also shows the possibility uh, in the future if there were some uh, uh, accessory dwelling units, those could be placed in the rear of these lots. Each lot could have uh, one accessory dwelling unit. Uh, isn't proposed tonight and these lots could come in in the future for accessory dwelling units. Generally, since this, uh, these are existing homes on this uh, lot, uh, the street view or the way when you drive by, you really wouldn't tell uh, the difference between the existing situation and the subdivision. It would allow for um, the opportunity for uh, uh, individual ownership of these parcels. So the options before you are um, to approve the tentative map, or option two would be to approve uh, the map with modifications or continue back and refer back to staff for additional analysis or reject the re request based on findings. Staff is recommending option one, approving the subdivision. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, I will go to the commission and ask if you have questions of staff. Commissioner Kogler? Uh, no questions. 
Commissioner Davis. One question, I was on DRC. Um, Darren, is there existing fencing or an intent to have fencing between the three parcels? Should that occur tonight? There is existing fencing and generally the intent is for the fencing to remain as is. Uh, with the with the subdivision, um, there will be the requirement to uh, finish the road improvements from around Oak Street around the corner of 28th. So there may need to be some changes in fencing in relation to those improvements, but uh, generally it would remain as is today. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Neal, questions? No questions. And Commissioner Gibson. I just have one in follow up to uh, Darren's comment. I had noted that um, in the analysis, it had stated that the developer is going to install the frontage improvements, including the new curb gutter sidewalks and driveway approaches. But I actually didn't see that language uh, identified in the uh, conditions exhibit A or exhibit B. Am I just missing it or is it there or could we possibly add that for clarity? The, re the requirement for the uh, so page 50 yes. so page 57 engineering condition number one is right. the condition regarding frontage improvements along 28th and Oak streets right so I saw that but I just said frontage improvements but didn't it identify what those were so could would it be possible for us to add the language you know, including new curb gutter sidewalks and driveway approaches so everybody understands what they're be being asked to do? Yes, we could add that language. Okay, well, that's, that's all the questions I have. All right, um, I don't have any questions, so I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the queue, including the applicant, who would like to speak? Madam Chair, I believe the applicant is available to speak. Hi right. there. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, could you state your name and your address for us, please? Yeah, this is Jessica Baker. And my address, like primary residence or the property address? Yeah. Your primary residence. Oh, 1420 New Wine Place in Templeton. All right, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys for taking the time tonight. I know everything ran late. Um, also, I wanted to just point out, as far as I can tell, on page 50 on our agenda, it does say that the developer is to install frontage improvements, including new curb gutter sidewalk and driveway approaches. So that is in there. All right. Is there anything else for us? That's all. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you guys. Sticking, sticking with us so late. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Thank you. All right. I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Um, Mr. Commissioner Kobler. Um, nothing specific, Madam Chair. This is very straightforward. I, I guess it just, when I looked at the, the 11 by 17 site plans, it kind of builds my frustration with the state requirement that the city really can't deal with parking for ADUs because this is pretty intensely developed and really it's going to be forcing on-street parking. But that's just an editorial comment. I'm certainly supportive of the, uh, the overall proposal. All right, thank you. Commissioner Davis? Yeah, I was on DRC for this item. It it just really seems to make sense to create the three parcels, the infrastructure's there. Um, I'm fine with the possibility of ADUs on these parcels, and there really is that key benefit for the frontage improvement. So I'll um, wholeheartedly support the Baker's request for subdivision. All right, thank you. Commissioner Neal? I too was on DRC and you know, saw this, and I... I am supportive of its um, approval. All right, and Commissioner Gibson? I also am uh, in, in approve, uh, an agreement or agree with the approval of this with the uh, the language that is on item 50. So the, the language on item 50 is not part of the actual resolution. Which I'm just seeking some sort of clarity, but other than that, um, I'm fully in favor of this project. 
All right, I am too. It makes is project makes good sense to me. All right, then may I ask for a uh, motion? You know, I'd like to make a motion, Madam Chair, to right. that the Planning Commission approve draft resolution A, approving tentative parcel map 20-0026, subject to conditions of approval with the um, uh, added language in the resolution regarding curb, gutter, and sidewalk. I'll second that sorry. motion. I'm sorry, who was the second, Gibson? Yep, Gibson seconds. All right, thank you. So a motion by Commissioner Davis, second by Gibson. May we have a roll call vote? Or, I'm sorry, any other discussion? All right, and may we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Commissioner Neal. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. All right, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, item number, agenda item number three plan development 19 15. Conditional use permit 19 15, P19 0131, 2930 Union Road. All right, so we have Darcy Delgado um, going to queue up her presentation right now. So, Darcy, I think you're on. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right, and sorry, I was having trouble. Can you see the PowerPoint? PowerPoint's up. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, so good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, Darcy Delgado, I'll be giving the presentation for the third item on the agenda. Uh, this is for a development plan and conditional use permit for an automotive collision repair facility um, for the company Autocraft. They're currently located just south of city limits in 10 city area. And from Autocraft tonight, we do have the applicant Keith Ham and his architect, uh, Tom Ray, who can um, help answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so the project's located on an approximately 2.8 acre parcel in the northeastern part of the city. Uh, it's bounded by Union Road to the north. There's a private residence to the west and some industrial development to the south. Uh, to the uh, east is an open lot. So you will note that the, um, the mini storage facility to the uh, southeast was recently heard by the commission back in July. Um, some of you also might recall that the site is currently used by Mays Fruit Stand, which has been operating along in the Union Road frontage for a few years now. Um, the fruit stand is not included in the project, um, and that was a question that had come up during our review of the site plan. So um, the fruit stand would eventually cease to operate here. Uh, the general plan designation is uh, commercial service. The zoning is a C3, which is a commercial light industrial. There's a plan development overlay and then a special district F overlay, uh, which requires a conditional use permit to be processed. Um, and that ensures that the use wouldn't create any noise, uh, visual or land use impacts to the neighboring land uses. Um, since this is an er in an area that um, has had rural residential uses, but then is of course trending towards the commercial and industrial uh, due to the zoning. Um, so the auto uh, repair use is also conditionally permitted in the C3 zone. So a conditional use permit would have been required had there not been a special overlay um, district here. Uh, so the project uh, proposes to construct uh, an approximately 21,000 square foot building for automotive collision repair, and then a future 5,000 square foot uh, building for vehicle calibration. And as I had mentioned, um, the conditional use permit is included in the request, both due to the use for auto repair as well as that overlay district. And so here is the overall site plan. Um, central to the site is the main building for the auto collision repair. Um, and to the left, which would be the southerly half of the lot, is the uh, future calibration shop building footprint. So I'll note that we do not have architectural details for the smaller building. Um, and the way we've uh, kind of sorted this out is that the project is conditioned so the architectural details would be submitted through the, um, through the Development Review Committee for compatibility with the main building. 
Um, the project is going to have to complete frontage improvements along Union Road, and that would include uh, curb gutter and sidewalk. And I will note on the site plan, you'll see um, a large oak tree is located at the northwest corner of the site. The tree will remain um, and be designed around and then also, of course, protected during construction. And here is the landscape plan, which uh, shows a fairly robust amount of landscaping for the site. Because there is a residence to the west, um, the landscape screening and as well as setbacks were pretty important here. Um, so I will say that the buildings will be set back about 78 feet. And then also the pads will sit about 10 feet lower than the grade at the western property line. And so this area is proposed to be planted with um, I noticed with some toyons, which is good for screening, um, there's several coast live oaks and valley oaks um, shown on the um, westerly property line and then just a variety of um, grasses and shrubs. Um, elsewhere on the site, they have a variety of trees used. Um, there's red maple, crepe myrtle, sycamore, um, and more coast live oaks. And um, the DRC had uh, previously reviewed the project. They had difficulty seeing the details of the landscape plan in particular at our last virtual meeting. Um, since they didn't have the physical plans in front of them, um, it, it was kind of difficult to demonstrate what the applicant was proposing, but it seemed that the, um, the eastern elevation was equally important to the DRC with how it was landscaped, but more so to help break up the elevation on that side of the building um, and not so much to act as a buffer um, on the east since the parcel is uh, currently vacant. And I wanted to include the floor plan here to show the commission how the facility functions. Uh, Autocraft uh, does specialize in collision repair, auto body work, um, painting services, and customization. The applicant has indicated uh, that as part of the use, uh, vehicles dropped off for service are immediately moved into the shop for repair. And then there are uh, typical hours for vehicles uh, to be worked on are Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. Um, occasionally, vehicles might be painted after, the, after uh, those particular hours, but since um, they're showing on their floor plan that they have their, um, all the operations are interior, they have an interior spray booth, um, that all these activities will be contained. So essentially, um, we do have a condition that relates to limiting the hours with regard to opening the, um, the roll doors. Um, and that was mostly just uh, to make sure that the use is, is compatible in this area, especially because there is residence uh, to the west. Um, and then lastly, any vehicles that would uh, remain on site overnight would be stored inside the shop. So the proposed building would be a single story metal building. Um, the applicant is proposing um, the siding and roof material to be uh, architectural grade metal panels, and they're using a couple of neutral uh, gray colors for the siding, and then a silver metallic for the roofing. And they're using their accent blue um, for uh, various roll doors and then man doors uh, throughout the building. Uh, so these are the front and rear elevations. Uh, so the north is the front elevation. Uh, the project was previously discussed by the Development Review Committee. They actually met twice. So the first time was March 9th, and then they met again June 1st. And uh, during the first meeting, the DRC had recommended that the applicant consider alternatives on their eastern elevation, which is actually on the next slide. Um, they, the DRC was looking for more articulation. Um, and then uh, another comment that was brought up at DRC was the, um, the color palette. And so the DRC had asked the applicant to tone down the blue, which uh, was more substantial in the first submittal. And the request was so that it would better blend in with the surrounding area. So then um, based on this feedback, the applicant resubmitted and uh, we took it back to DRC for that second meeting and the DRC felt the changes were acceptable uh, to move it uh, forward to the planning commission. Uh, so here are the east and west elevations. Um, so on the east elevation, uh, I will point out that kind of that darker gray color um, is uh, represents a split face CMU wall and that is to screen some of their uh, mechanical equipment on that side. Um, otherwise, they're duplicating throughout the building at the use of the different gray tones, which appear to help break up um, the elevation somewhat, uh, along with some vertical elements on the seams of the panels. 
And so kind of, we can always go back to it if the deer or if the planning commission wants to take another look, but when combined with the landscape plan, um, just want to point out that the commission should consider if the intent to provide an articulated Eastern elevation has been met, which was originally pointed out during that first uh, DRC meeting back in March. Darcy, I'm, I and didn't see the east and west elevations. All I saw was north and south. There they are. Thank you. Apologize if that didn't progress forward. Um, so, um, so here are the options before the commission tonight. Um, the option one would be to approve the project. So we did um, prepare, uh, so this would be 1A, we did prepare and circulate for public review and initial study and uh, a mitigated negative declaration. And so part of option one is to certify the environmental document. And then um, part B would be to approve the resolution to approve the development plan with a conditional use permit. And as I had mentioned before, there are some conditions um, related to the use, um, the, the time, the um, to limit uh, uh, noise that we could be associated with the use. Um, so uh, we do have our, our noise ordinance. So regardless, they still have to comply with the noise ordinance. So it's kind of written in such a way to, to um, provide some flexibility, but acknowledging that there is some sensitivity um, in the area. Um, the other options before the commission would be to uh, amend the um, the above listed actions to refer back to staff or DRC or um, to make findings to deny the application. Uh, so that concludes my staff presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, we have uh, the applicant uh, available to help answer questions as well. All right, thank you very much, Darcy. Um, all right, questions from commissioners, Commissioner Kogler? Uh, no questions. I was on DRC both times, and I think the applicant has done a very good job complying with the recommendations that that body came forward with. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Davis? Yeah, Darcy, um, have we received any correspondence on this application from the neighbor, business or residential? Uh, no, there have not been any uh, no inquiries on tonight's meeting or just general questions on the um, project uh, the only comment that was received was regarding the mitigated negative declaration. And so that was addressed in the staff report. Um, uh, uh, there was a request for a phase one um, cultural study to be prepared. And so um, I did note in our in the staff report as well as in the um, initial study that uh, due to the location of the, the project and um, it didn't appear that there were any um, uh, sensitive uh, resources nearby, but we do have condition that would require um, uh, uh, if any buried or un, uh, resources were discovered during construction that um, that they follow a certain protocol. So that was the only comment that was received on the project and um, staff was able to address it in the staff report as well as the environmental document. Okay, and just real quick on um, page 73 of the staff report, um, there at the bottom it says ensure auto repair work does not occur beyond the daytime hours of 7 p.m. Are we giving them extended hours or should that be 5 p.m.? So <clears throat> the, the the way that I was trying to kind of frame this was to acknowledge that if Autocraft left or if they wanted to modify their, even if they, you know, they plan to be here long term, um, since the CUP will run with the land is to not, to provide some flexibility, but to, you know, acknowledge that we do have a conditional use permit here and we want to make sure that it's, um, complying, you know, with, with the, like I said, the noise ordinance. And then if they are doing work past, um, you know, eight to five is their hours, but if they're doing work, you know, until seven, um, our noise ordinance says that that's, um, starts moving into the evening hours. And so the way it's conditioned would be that they would have to make sure that they're not, you know, creating any additional noise beyond the noise ordinance. And so it'd be better if they, you know, shut their doors, if they're working after hours. Um, certainly the, they could, you know, um, we could limit the hours of operation, but I think we were just trying to provide them some flexibility um, so that they wouldn't have to go back and amend a conditional use permit to gain an extra hour or two. Okay, and that would apply to both buildings, that second building? Um, yes, and perhaps the applicant can elaborate. My understanding is that building, when it's when they're calibrating, it's fully enclosed because they can't have any reflection, reflection when they're um, That's what I was thinking. Certain, 
Yeah. Right. So I, and, and they might be able to better answer that because we didn't have a whole lot of information um, on it since it hasn't, you know, we just have the building footprint. Um, so maybe we can reserve that for uh, okay. Keith Ham to answer. Thank you. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mr. Commissioner Neal. So I was on DRC the first time this came and I think it's a, a great project. I think it's cited very well. Um, I think the landscaping is impressive. Um, and it'd be nice to see this kind of landscaping on all of our projects. Thank you. Commissioner Gibson. Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, I think this uh, project is appropriate for the site. Um, I have some questions on uh, the site itself probably. So uh, Darcy, I, I went out there and it looked like uh, uh, they had the uh, property line staked. There's some stakes out there. Is that the approximate property line? So uh, let me go back. So I have not seen any stakes out there myself, but um, I guess this there's one a, should work Yeah, there's fine. a series, a yeah. series of stakes running north to south that looked like it was probably the pro approximate property line. Right. So this, so the heavier black is um, what I kind of called out. So on the site plan, I called called that out so it's a little right. easier yeah. to see everything. And that would be the property lines that they're right. proposing. So they also have a dedication um, along Union Road. So um, okay. I, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head what that dedication is. But right. so um, I, was, I was trying to look at it from all angles because I was trying to figure out some of my, answer my own questions. But uh, when we looked at the mini storage and I and noted there's a significant, uh, I would call it a water basin or water collection basin or something that runs uh, from, the, from the south to the north uh, that looks like it would uh, impact um, the east side of this property. It runs in between Daniels Woodland and the mini storage and whatever that other graded pad is. So is there any plans for mitigating that water? I mean, the water looks like it runs all the way from the top of the hill, past Spur, um, you know, through Daniel Woodland and significant water basin. So I'm just thinking as large as that is, there must be a fair amount of water that f flows through there. Sure, so, and yeah, I'm wondering if we have David Athey still on the line. Yeah, I can answer that question, Darcy. So, um, on the screen there that you're looking at, there is uh, where it says multi storage facility or mini storage facility. Mini, mini storage, that. yeah. And mini. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, the water actually coming down through that swale is an engineered uh, drainage system uh -huh. that uh, Pacific, Daniel, Lidlin, uh both share. And the water exiting that point. Um, flows just to the east of that red line, uh, that approximate property line right there, uh -huh. towards a culvert that is located at Union Road. So okay. this project this project is going to be designed um, not impact that drainage, and actually the city owns the parcel next door to the east. And oh, that's that the fire department, of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So as that parcel develops in the future, then um, the city will have to, you know, look at ways of handling that flow if necessary. Uh, okay. After All right. So while while I have you on on the line, <laughs> let me ask you a couple other questions. So on page uh, 106, item number 10, it says the applicant shall install a eight inch sewer line along the east side of the property, but um, they was connecting uh, the recently constructed sewer for Ardmore Road with a manhole near Union Road. And I, that was not making any sense because Ardmore Road right now doesn't go all the way through. And I was trying to figure out where exactly is that sewer line run? Yeah, so it uh, the sewer line right now is at the corner where it says mini storage and the red line there for that parcel. Okay. Uh, the sewer line is stubbed out to to approximately that location. Okay. Um, so from about there, north towards Union Road, um, the project will install a, a, the eight inch sewer line and make that connection. Okay, and and the purpose of that, David, is is that this facility using, gonna be utilizing that sewer or is it just something we're that, doing to get it done? That's correct. Um, 
this this project will utilize that sewer and it's our policy to make um, or to require the applicant to install the along the length of the property line. Uh -huh. And that is why we're also in, uh, including a provision in there that they can file a reimbursement agreement. So when um, that basically means that uh, they'll go to city council, the council to um, look at the different parcels. In this case, the parcel directly to the east, the city parcel, mm -hmm. uh, and put a requirement that when the city parcel developed, um, that they would pay a portion of that back to this developer for the installation of that sewer line. Okay. Basically, so one, basically the share cost. So one, one more one more question. So um, on that same page, number 12 is frontage improvements. It's, it says that the applicant uh, shall install the frontage improvements and Darcy indicated, you know, the uh, that as well. Uh, I didn't see a timing in there. Is there a timing? Do we have a timing or agreement for when that would be get, uh, accomplished? Yeah, on, on number 12, it's right underneath the um, right underneath the timing prior to building permit. Oh, okay. I missed it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, no, it's okay. Perfect. That's, typical. <laughs> That's typical for all our development. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so I just have uh, one other comment, just uh, it's probably just a housekeeping. So on our page, looking for a page, can't figure it out. This looks like, anyway, the east elevation, it says proposed west elevation on two pages, and I believe it's actually supposed to be uh, east. I don't know how important that is. On yours, I noticed, Darcy, it's correct. Uh, anyway, that's all my questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I do not have any questions. So um, we will open up the public hearing. And Melissa, do we have any callers? No, Madam Chair, we do not. Available? All right, is the applicant on the line? I don't have an applicant yeah. in the call in studio. Okay. I'm, I'm on the oh. line. Uh, my name is Keith Ham, uh, Madam Chair and the Commissioners. All so, right, thank you. No problem. So to answer your guys' question about the calibration building, uh, that the work that's done in there is very quiet. It's mainly like scanning and computing and targets. So there's not even a running car, no hammers, no no noise period. And then, um, yeah, and any other questions you guys might have? Um. I think we had our questions out, so thank you very much. No um, and we will go to, um, I'll close the public hearing. We'll go to commissioner comments, Commissioner Kogler. Uh, no further comments. I certainly support the uh, proposal. Okay, Commissioner Davis. Likewise. Commissioner Neal. The same. Okay, Commissioner Gibson. Ditto. Okay, sounds good. I was on the second DRC meeting and I thought it was um, a well done project. So I believe um, I'm ready for a motion. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. All right, Commissioner Neal. Uh, I'd like to move to approve draft resolution A, certifying the mitigated negative declaration for the project. These are I'll separate, Mr. Frace. Separate resolutions, please. Yes. Okay, All right. I'll second, and I'll second the motion. Seconded by Gibson. Moved by Neil, seconded by Gibson. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Resolution A passes 5-0. Madam Chair, I'd like to make another resolution if I could. Yes, please. Approved grass res draft resolution B, approving plan development 19-15 and conditional use permit 19-15, subject to the site-specific conditions of approval. I'll second that. All right, motion by Commissioner Neal, second by Davis. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Neal. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Kogler. Aye. 
Commissioner Gibson. Aye. Chairperson Jorgensen. Aye. Motion passes 5 0 for resolution B. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and congratulations to the applicant. And um, let's see, we have already, do we have discussion items tonight, Mr. Price? We have no other discussion items for you tonight. Okay, and we've dealt with the consent calendar already. Other reports? So let's see, I think our, let me get back to the starting of the agenda here. Okay, other reports. So committee reports, housing constraints and opportunities committee. Um, so they haven't met recently. They were involved in the recommendation to the city council and planning commission of the joint session on the housing element process. Um, as we move forward with housing element implementation, we do plan to reconvene the housing constraints and advisory committee um, further. All right. Um, anything else? That's it. All right. Thank you. Planning Commissioner comments. Let's start with Commissioner Gibson. Um, I, I just have uh, two comments. Uh, one, I think we might have missed the approving the Planning Commission minutes, which was the last item of uh, last meeting, because we, in essence, uh, tabled the meeting, so just a comment. And then second, um, I am going to be out of town on August 31st and I'm on DRC. Assuming we have DRC, I would ask if somebody would volunteer to take my place that day. So those are my comments. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner Neal. I would just like to thank staff for bringing what was an intransigent um, commissioner along on that first item. I appreciate the um, the, the result that came of that, and um, I'd just like to thank staff. Very good. Commissioner Davis? I, too, would like to thank staff. I know how hard they worked on the uh, Beechwood project, and... Um, not an easy one. I, I noticed this evening how each of us as planning commissioners have a very unique lens, but when it comes right down to it, we really want what's best from Paso. And I totally applaud each and every one of you with your, um, with your thoughts. I think uh, we came together tonight and I'm proud of that. Thank you for your comments and Commissioner Kobler. Uh, kudos to staff. A very nice job helping us guide through that tonight and to you, Madam Chair, as well for the way you handled the meeting. This was not an easy follow up and continuation of last time's discussion and I, I we're fortunate to have gotten through it and I appreciate your leadership. And I would be glad to take the uh, DRC on the 31st for Commissioner Gibson. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for DRC. Um, I just would would echo what the other commissioners have said. This was a tough one. It was really, really hard. And I don't think any of us um, agreed with everything, but I think, and I agree that, that thank you, Warren, for coming up with that good compromise about larger um, uh, development plan areas. I hope the city council concurs and um, I hope that, and, and also for your thoughts on on adding quality specificity to the um, architectural and design portions of a specific plan from the uptown uh, specific plan, which is a and the uptown specific plan being a fantastic example of, of success. So thank you and thank you to all of my fellow commissioners. Um, I think it was a good compromise. Nobody was perfectly happy, but nobody was perfectly unhappy. And that's supposed to be a good deal, right? So thank you, everybody. It's late. Um, 
we have oh we have staff comments and Warren. Yeah, we'd just like to thank the commission for all their work tonight. This was a difficult item. You stuck with it. I think you raised a lot of really important issues. The project and process was improved because of it. So, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. You, and you did a good job. And we really appreciate that. And we'll get it um, ready for council and include all your uh, hard work on that and pass that along. And then in terms of just upcoming items, next meeting is August 25th. Um, we have a fairly big project on that agenda. Um, Almond Acres Charter School on Niblick Road um, will be on that agenda. I believe Chairman Jorgensen, Chairperson Jorgensen, you're not gonna be at that meeting, is that correct? I will not, and um, Commissioner Pro Tem Kogler has agreed to chair it. Okay, so um, I think everybody should be prepared for another um, fairly exciting and lengthy item on your next agenda. We'll probably also have a time extension um, for the Vina Vista RV park. And with that, uh, that concludes staff's comments. Just one, one comment to add. Except for Darren's comment. <laughs> uh, just on the, Almond, on the Almond Acres project, we're looking at taking that to DRC this coming up Monday. So uh, the DRC will get a chance to look at that and it'll be a good uh, lead in to the commission meeting the next week. All right, very good, thank you. Thank you both. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. All right, thank you. Commissioner Gibson, a second? Second. And everybody said aye. Aye. Aye, <laughs> aye everybody. Good night, Good night, all. Good night.